Easy. Just the same as way y'all never watch Love Jones. Love watch what? Love Jones. It's not a part of my culture. Okay. Uh, hey, Lou. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm calling for you. Right. And then you do call. Uh, right. Uh, you can leave that open. Five, seven, six. Uh, we got a gavel. Oh, I did not. Dan, can I leave you here? Uh, put them outside on the uh, in front of the festival. Uh, all right. Uh, good evening, and welcome to the uh, October twenty third, twenty twenty three, Board of Trustees work session. May I have a motion to open the meeting? So, oh. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Get my work session out. Uh, since we have so many village employees here tonight, uh, we're going to start with the items that they are here for so that they can go home at a decent hour. Uh, they are here almost exclusively for the capital items. Jerry, you wanna walk us through? Work session capital items? Hold on, Let's hold on. start with. Uh, this is, so this is uh, 2B. 2B, can we go in reverse and do 2B4 first? Yeah, we'll do whatever you want. Okay. So there are two items that the chief has. Um, it's replacing 321, unit 321, and also finally, we're moving, um, replacing some of our parking enforcement officer vehicles. Not finally, but they're getting to the end of their life. And then they got a lot of time and they want to continue to utilize the prime uh, automobiles that they are. So we currently have four public enforcement officers for the cost of hiring this year. Right now, we only have four. We would need additional ones for a new position. But also, the four vehicles. Prior, we'll push to all the same time and age each other. End of life, they're over 10 years old. So, what we'd like to do is to purchase one vehicle for the new position and replace two of the existing vehicles with two new vehicles, and then the remaining two the following year. So, we don't do it all at one. And this is on the capital plan for this year? Yes. Okay. Do we have any questions or concerns? So is it on the capital budget we adopted? Is, is it on the uh, five-year capital plan? So it's on the really big plan that's yeah. not really an accomplishable plan. It's, it's the really big plan that mm -hmm. we're slowly chipping away at and try to accomplish it all. But within five years is pretty unrealistic. So we're trying to do as much as we can within the boundaries that we have. And I can tell you that in the last five years, so maybe four years, we, um, we've committed to $35 million in capital purchases, mm -hmm. and our taxes have remained below the tax gap every single year. So we do a good job managing our costs, managing the capital expenditures that we have, and we'll continue to do that. That's my focus on revenue. That's also the focus on making sure that we're purchasing things at their end of useful life and not just when they start to get banged up and look ugly. That's the reality. Yeah, I mean, aside from supply chain issues, uh, vehicles and equipment is kind of the low hanging fruit of the capital plan. That's the easiest That's stuff to, to find and, and purchase and replace. Is is there still a backlog when you order vehicles? Or, or is, have we caught up a bit? Some manufacturers, not all. Okay. And these are hybrids, right? They're plug in hybrids or? Either. The new, the new faces with either one. Okay. They're like all three. Questions, concerns? So what's going to be the effect on the operating budget next year? So how much is the interest 
you know, because interest rates are going up. And I mean, my concern isn't any specific item. I mean, I'm not saying that any of the things in this five-year plan are things yep. that the village doesn't need or want. Sure. But we typically don't spend that hundred plus million dollars over five years. So I think we're, I really, you know, again, I, I'm harping on, I think that we need to adopt, I know that we need to adopt a capital budget for, a, for a one year period when we adopt our regular budget and sure. also have a five year capital budget, not just a spending plan. And sure. that when something is adjusted, we were able to take something away. And that's that's my ongoing well, concern. Adopt a capital limit, that's probably what you want to adopt. And what I can say is that some years we've we've had during COVID three, four, five year, um, five million dollar capital plans, and then a couple of years ago we had a fifteen million dollar. So it fluctuates based on the needs of the based on the needs of the community, needs of the organization. But you can look at um, seven to eight million dollars of capital expenditures expenditures. And we can comfortably include that in the budget annually because we have we've shown that we have been able to do that. So that's an average. I'm just looking at average expense. And I'm just looking for something more concrete so that if we if 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 something comes up that's that's not that we hadn't planned on, we can figure out how to adjust. You, you can. We also have 18 million if something comes up uh, that is unplanned or all of a sudden we need to spend a couple million dollars. You have significant money in the reserves that all of us have contributed to board of trustees and staff to be able to handle those emergencies. These are items that have been worked into the capital plan discussed significantly with the staff and made sure that- And they were on the schedule for this year. Yeah, and they're on schedule for this year. But there's so much on the schedule for this year and there's so much in that big plan. And my point continues to be, I think we have to, know what we're going to spend in a given year and when we take something else off that list figure out what we're going to take away from what we planned on spending and I mean, that's I, right. you know so i mean I'm, I'm included in that my number is going to be high mm -hmm. but i think that's a board decision not my decision but of course you can consult and i can give my opinion i'm straightforward the reality is we have been handling seven to nine million dollars annually on average of capital and taxes are nowhere near going up to the cap. We're staying above, below the cap all the time. And significantly below the cap. So there's room to grow, there's room to reinvest in the community. And I think deferring things like 20 year old parks mm -hmm. may not be exactly, you know, the best way to go. We continue to go. 10 year old vehicles. Uh, I'm not sure about the boats. Oh, 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 oh. My bad. My bad. Pardon me. But I, but I can tell you seven to nine million dollars, the staff and the budget officer can handle that amount of capital expenditure within the trend and budget that we've been managing. Okay. And didn't we just come under budget uh, last year? And the year before and the year before. Yeah. So so it's, it's not like we're we're spending money we don't have. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, everybody's fun. The uh, Vehicles? Yes. Well, let's talk about the boat. Yes. So the other item, and I've asked Jeff to understand and kind of help me guide them through this. So under the police department, we have big constables. We have two boats. One of the boats is over 20 years old. 20 years old. Um, for the past two years, we've applied for a grant with the US Coast Guard to try to uh, obtain at least 75% of the funding for a new boat. Unfortunately, we have not been successful for the last two years in finding funding for that grant. So we're going to apply again this year. But the question is if we don't buy the boat out of our own funding and we don't get the grant funding, then we're going to have to put more money into the boat to get operated. So, yeah. how much would we have to put into the boat? What are we talking about? We're talking about $86,000. To buy what? No, that's that's repairs. That's so that repairs. would be for repairs of the engines to keep the engines in service. Right now, they're at their service life. They're at twenty five hundred dollars, which is the service life for those engines. 
So there's a lot of external parts that need to be replaced, intercoolers, oil coolers, or units. You replace all that stuff, you're not, you don't know what's going on internally. So that's the issue with just spending this 40 something thousand dollars just to hold these parts on external <laughs> The other option would be to buy replacement motors, you know, for that boat, which is about 42 pounds. And what's the boat worth? Uh, I, I presume if we got a new boat, we would get rid of the old one, right? What, 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 what's so the problem? Like somewhere between 75,000, 15, 75,000. Oh, okay. so, so we can, so essentially we can pull that amount off of whatever we pay on a new boat because it's. Yeah. All right. When when would the new boat come in? Is there a delay with this as well? Or maybe about a year. Maybe a little bit. And then, what about the other? What, tell us about the other boat. Are there two boats here. Harbor one. one. Harbor one. That's a that's my work boat that I use at the Harbor Master's office. So that boat is right now. It's not right because the motor blew up. And it's out of service. That boat was wow. in 1982. The boat was in 1982. So oh, it's really. old. And it doesn't really do what I needed to do. It's too big. I need a more smaller <laughs> boat to get around the dock and get right. points around and that kind of stuff. So that's the other thing that I want to replace. Is that. How many times have these boats, uh, especially that last one, in 82, how, long, how many times have the, that boat come, you've come up to the board um, requesting a new one? So what are you doing now? I'm begging Kenny at CTO if I need something moved to, to have him move it. We're not operational now. Gotcha. Well, guys, uh, we see who definitely needs the harbor master boat. So what do you want to do with the harbor the fleet boat? Is that something we would I know with the delay, it was coming here. Is that something we'd pay for now yeah. or we'd pay for on, upon receipt? Yeah, we'd be able to deposit now and yeah. order it, then the rest of the balance is on receipt. Um, when I had the privilege of touring the Harbor Master um, area with you, and you were telling me that all the areas that we cover, and we cover more than just the village of Mermaronic, can you, can we? ask for funding from other people since we are um, patrolling in <laughs> their areas as well. We, we already get money from Larchmont. Yeah, but you apply for as part of the grant and justification being included there, mutual aid and how we respond to other locations and we participate in drills with the Coast Guard and other municipalities. And that's the reason they want to apply for that additional funding. Mm -hmm. uh, we just only heard that we didn't receive the grant funding a couple of weeks ago. So by this time next year, we would know if we received the grant funding. So timing-wise with the boat, it could be possible that we receive funding. Did, um, did they ever tell you why you don't as to how you can approve? Just lack of funding for other municipalities that receives funding. Um, they only have so much money and unfortunately, we were mm -hmm. not one of the ones to receive the funding. I think last year it went to Suffolk County. That's what County for the uh, wind farms. Right now, a lot mm -hmm. of the port security money is going to that. Yeah, it's the port security grant, which probably makes it a little not as competitive as some other larger uh, municipal entities that uh, have complex traffic going in and out of their harbors. Um, but like uh, Jeff mentioned, uh, and I mentioned, we already get money from Largemont, Largemont Yacht, Yacht Club. They yeah. manage uh, Largemont Harbor for the village of Largemont. So we already are, we already are receiving, is it twelve to 15000 a year? Yeah. Also, we're going to be also applying for two other grants from the Port Security. It's a different grant than the boats. Mm -hmm. But one is for training and school, and the other one is for engine maintenance. So, like the maintenance of new engines, high new engines for 321 now, we can probably get funded through that. Because those aren't very competitive grants, nobody applies for them. And so those we would probably get. And what's the, what would be the total grant, like a ward amount? Uh, it would probably be somewhere around the 40000 the fuel and training grant is twenty five thousand. So, right? Yeah. So that that quote for the people who the motor. So if we were to get a separate grant for motor, that money would be deducted. Oh, so you could buy it. You could do it for new for new motors. Okay. 
And right. if we get a grant from the Coast Guard and you've already committed to buying the boat, does that matter? I mean, they'll will they still fund it? If I, I think they'll still fund it as long as it meets their specs. Like to, uh -huh. to be the Coast Guard boat has to have the sea burn technology uh -huh. in case there's some kind of nuclear attack. The, the cockpit has to be sealed. So as long as it has those features, then it's good. I know where I'm going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be a crowded cockpit. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Wow. Who told us that? <laughs> yeah. With our, I have a question for Chief. With our like new accreditation for the department, like how do you think that would boost our odds in getting and receiving this grant for the boat? Or is that like is that separate? Um, it's definitely something that we can include as part of a proposal. But also, um, we just did a huge training with uh, other municipalities mm -hmm. with the boat search and rescue. So I think as part of that, um, there's guys that did come here, we're able to see uh, the types of things that we can do. So that's what it's important to them, you know, connecting. We've had a big uh, interagency drill with the Coast Guard, the county, Herschel, Fly, Yonkers. And when they, when they came here and saw what we can do, they were. The Coast Guard was really impressed with the equipment. You know, the other boats have that we didn't have, so I think that would help us you know, see that uh, we're going once without you know, the state boat and that all these other departments have. Mm -hmm. okay. you know, and we're still able to find the boat and do all the stuff that they did. So. Uh -huh. We also get navigation aid. Yep. That happens almost every year, right? Yes. Yeah. So what is that? That's uh, state funding from the state for the Marine Corps. Okay. 32 gay per year. Yep. Thanks, Hope. All right. Uh, is everybody fine with the boats to replenish the, yeah. the fleet? <clears throat> yeah. How many boats do we have? The police department has two 321 and 327. The harbor master's office has two, and recreation has one. The one little red boat. Doesn't know. Doesn't know. Doesn't, yeah. doesn't float. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's not that's a good attribute. Yeah. <laughs> that's why it's not so, so why not put why not sell it? it? Well, well why do we still have it if you don't use it? <laughs> so now we have like a little safety issue. All right, skipper. All right. And then yeah, thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Good thank luck you. with the uh bailing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Come on, Jason. Don't ask for a boat. I'm not asking for a boat. Good evening, ma'am, board. Um I'm so tonight we're asking for some improvements um, in the red and blue room of the pavilion. Uh, so we have two uh, multi-purpose rooms on the Harbor Island Pavilion. Um, one is the, called the Red Room because it's board red. One called Blue because the blue okay, board blue keeps is currently using the blue room, um, and we use the Red Room for different special needs activities, uh, fitness, obviously uh, senior programming or camp stuff. Uh, so we do a lot, a lot in there. The floors are twenty-five. Plus years old, they've been there a long time. Um, they've survived the flood or two uh, as well, and uh, they reached the end of their life. So I work with the park foreman and city manager to uh, come up with a quote for for that project. Um, we have a limited availability when we can do this work because the pavilion is pretty much in use seven days per week from morning to night. Uh, so. We would do this work at the end of August, the last three weeks of August after camp is over and before school starts. Um, we would have that opportunity. Uh, so we're asking for the money during this period because it's going to take us time to schedule it and make sure that we can have everything ready for those three weeks at the end of August. Because we missed that window. Uh, we would have to cancel a lot of programs and we're not trying to inconvenience any community, community stuff going on. So, um, in addition to the red and blue room, is that we, we currently lease the space for the after school program, which is about 27 five a year. Yes. Right? 27 five a year. So it's a little over two a year. Yeah, it's two years. So 
we didn't have that program. We didn't develop that program. We don't really manage that program. It's basically a space. And we want to make sure that, you know, they're around for a little while because we do pretty well. As far as that, you know, over $2,000 a month, but $60,000 improvement in the entire building for the two red and blue room um, is easily covered by something like that. Um, these floors will also be uh, resilient. The jet pond will has worked away so that if it floods, we can take them out, power wash them, get the floors all dry, and then put them back in. It's going to be like a thick rubber. So uh, once again, we're thinking about if we do flood, how we can get back to the room as soon as possible. Um, like we did with the fires. Correct. Yeah, and I made it smart with it. Yes, sir. True. Everyone <laughs> look at it like this. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. It's coming along nicely. Okay. Um, so we also have quite a bit of storage issues. Uh, you know, we run 30 plus federal events, all of them have programs. Like we have uh, two uh, larger trailers behind the building that are filled to the max. We use some of the old volunteers, fire truck and ladder firehouse. Uh, so we're asking to take the adjacent room next to the red room and build a little storage area um, with closets and a door. So we can really get all of our event things and everything organized properly. Um, also, try to free up space so in the old firehouse so that we can have our emergency block supply and we'll have a little bit better. Um, so then we want to do that at the same time because obviously we want to do the adjacent storage area at the same time uh, to minimize the impact. Okay. Questions or concerns for Mr. Pinto? Is it, yeah, is it possible to do, have like kind of an external kind of storage at the harbor at the near the beach near pavilion? Would that be better than like adding this like kind of add on, or do you think it's better that everything's in under that one kind of roof? So we do have external storage, they're, they're shipping containers, mm -hmm. um, and uh, they're not temperature controlled, which is an issue. You're storing mm -hmm. t shirts, you know, if I were 50 new t shirts, I like to keep them for next year. They have to be in climate control. No, uh, yeah, I get it. I get it. So there's certain items that I would rather not store outside, whereas sports equipment we can, and other items. And if you ever come in the building, I'll give you a tour. It's packed to the gills. Oh, I, yeah, I've seen it. It's a difficult situation. And I have a question about the red and blue room. Is that something I know we kind of lease it out? Would I mean, I don't think it makes sense. I, I'm just trying to think of how we can get the people who are leasing that space to kind of be included in that kind of renovation because they're using that space. Is their fee going to go up per year or because we're kind of doing this renovation for them to use so the space? Last year, uh, the village manager signed a four-year contract with percentage increases. To keep, to keep, to keep some. Okay. And you got to remember, keeps is a not-for-profit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, used to, you know, the kids in this community that have been affordable, take child care. I signed off on a four-year because we gave them 10% increase that they agreed to. Okay. So it's a decent four years is a decent increase. That makes sense. I just want to make sure we're capturing that. Yeah. And they are a they are a uh, they're great. They're great in their community uh, group that has uh, struggled over the years to find a space that suits them and it suits them really well. And they get along with uh, everybody down there. I don't. I lived in a few communities. I, I never recall having that kind of a program in any of the communities I've lived in. So I don't know if it's unique or not to our area, but Definitely unique to me. It's definitely unique to America. It was, it was started a long time ago by a lot of uh, good people and, and kept going. Thank God. But Rye has it. Scarsdale has it. That's good. Yeah. That's good. I mean, similar, not the same problem. Mm -hmm. So, those are the two um, pavilion improvements. Like I said, the pavilion is old. It can use a lot more work, but those are the ones that need to be done immediately um, while we figure out what our future plans are. Mm -hmm. Last slide I'm going to have on here is a, a Toro electric uh, UTV, which is basically a full work vehicle. Um, people don't realize this, but the recreation department does a lot of beach maintenance. Uh, we also do a lot of programs throughout the park. Uh, we currently have a golf cart that is getting destroyed by being used as a work vehicle. And um, it shouldn't be um, because now when I need it to transport people and use it for programs, it's not ideal. So um, we're asking for an all-electric version uh, that we can move two to 44 acres of Hard Rock Park to do everything we need to do with the program, whether it's beach maintenance, moving garbage cans, throwing out garbage, using something that will take a beating more than uh, something that should be on the links. So, 
And, and these um, vehicles can be stored high and dry in the event of uh, coastal flooding? Correct. Yeah, this particular, so the original golf cart, that'd be 40 years ago now we bought it, mm -hmm. it was car batteries. Now it's lithium ion, kind of like a Tesla battery built in. They're so much more efficient than the car battery situation, mm -hmm. um, whereas this thing will last a long time. To lose some of our threat for storms, mm -hmm. whether it's a coastal or river um, issue, uh, we move a lot of stuff to the pier, or we'll move it to like um, the, the Old firehouse, or yeah, places right. like that. Uh, sometimes yeah. in the regatta parking lot, I usually park places underneath. Um, yeah. The golf cart uh, doesn't have like a doors and stuff, so I usually park in the Jerry spot in the regatta, like underneath the regatta. Right. Um, but everything is moved in the pavilion, just in case you were curious. We have a lot of commercial metal racks, mm -hmm. and everything gets lifted up. A lot of things stay up, and then everything that's not up gets lifted up to the table. So like, you would have to have six feet of water to destroy it, a lot of our stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we've been through this before quite a bit. Yeah. So our floor has been through the blue and red floor. I've been through a lot. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Penta? I'm going to bring up the star of the show now. Um, I'll be up here with Jeff in case you have any questions. Yeah. Gotcha. And then you guys in the spurs. What perfect. So what I just handed you guys, I sent I sent out in May. Those are pictures of the two parts I'm gonna be talking about tonight. Uh, first requesting an all electric ride on mower and trailer for the parks department use. It's a gravely six foot electric mower. Uh, right now we use John Deere diesel mowers. Uh, we're going to start trying to explore the electrical power world and see if they will be cut out for commercial use. Um, with the electric ride on mower, we're going to need to start trailering it. Right now, we drive our machines to each park, but because this is all electric and all battery, uh, if we drive this machine to all the parks, it cuts about two hours off of our cut time. Wow. Well, so, what are you going to trail it with? What are you going to drag it? Uh, just a regular pickup truck. Trailer. You're not gonna need a new pickup truck. No, no, no. I have a lot of those. No, not yet. Not yet. I've seen this movie before. Not yet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> Anybody have any questions on the electric mower or trailer? So, no. So this, 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 I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, you started talking. Does, does the electric mower work as well as the? They say it does. Um. You know, this is a little more beefier than your Ego or Ryobi right on electric lawnmower. This actually has Tesla batteries. Oh, wow. So it's a little more advanced. Each blade is run off its own motor. Wow. It's not one motor for the whole machine. So there's three blades on this machine. Each blade has its own motor. Okay. So the great is a big golf course maintenance company and commercial mower. They don't really make or sell a fourth electric trailer for. No, this is the first commercial grade electric mower out on the market. Gotcha. That made for acres and acres of grass. Yeah. Gotcha. And, and this equipment will be charged where? Uh, in the parks garage. Um, so this equipment comes with a charging cart. You don't plug the machine in. You actually take the batteries out and put them on the cart. Um, you know, we have an in-house electrician that can do whatever um, renovation is necessary to the electrical system to charge it. Um, you have 220 or yeah yeah so this price comes with an additional set of batteries this way i can go a full eight hours of cutting like i do with my gas powered machine take the batteries out charge take them the batteries i can leave the machine in the park mm -hmm. transport the batteries back to the garage grab the new set of batteries bring them back out to the machine plug them in the machine continue cutting grass i don't have to trailer the machine back and forth to charge it gotcha and uh, uh, I know Tesla also makes solar powered units to charge batteries, too. There is a solar panel roof option on it, but I was told by the supplier that it is very brand new and the amount that it would have to stay out in the sun wouldn't work for us. Okay. 
Lunch? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Plus, we really don't like having canopies over our grass cutting equipment because we have a lot of trees here mm -hmm. and we cut under those trees. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of those branches ca catches one of the canopies with the solar panel on it, then mm -hmm. it's just, it becomes a big, bushless plunge. What I'm thinking is wherever you're taking the batteries to charge, if there was a, a uh, you know, Oh, at the parks building, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, the parks building. Yeah, that's different. That's a oh, story. That, that's a whole different discussion and, and story. Yeah, I well, just, I need to I, wait to say something. No, so. it's fine. I'm, Go I'm patient. Um, can the trailer be uh, multi-purposeful? The trailer can be used for anything that will fit on it. Okay. It's not just for the electrical lawnmower. I just need it to shuffle the electrical lawnmower back and forth to each park. But in case of a storm and someone needs to trailer a boat around then it could trailer a boat around if a piece of equipment breaks down on the road i don't have to call a tow truck and i could just winch a piece of equipment up on the trailer and bring it to where we need to go okay a trailer is a multi-purpose yeah, yeah that everybody in the village could use if gino needs a trailer for something then i'll meet him with the trailer okay all right okay any other questions for and these will all be delivered in 2025, correct? Uh, as of right now, he doesn't have a lead time on this. I, I spoke to him last week. I'm waiting for him to get back to me. Um, I'm assuming that it's a year out because almost everything's a year out, park wise, equipment wise. So I'm not I'm not guessing that we would get this this year. The mow is a year out. She's Wow. Yeah. Because you got to remember it's all electric. So electric has more computer system, has more chips, yeah. has more everything. So it's not like a regular diesel machine where it just has an engine in it, yep. start it up and go. It has an alternator, it has a battery. This has batteries, computer chips, software. It has like a little brain in it that controls the whole piece of equipment. Are we losing money with the equipment that we have right now? Are we losing money with the equipment we have right now? I have a very good parks mechanic mm -hmm. who keeps our 15 year old equipment running and smoothly. Okay. They are 15 years old. We do a good job of upkeeping them. But eventually. Not eventually. We are spending more than we should on keeping those machines running. Okay. So, so I That's should fine. say if I can, Mayor, the original conversation between Jeff and I was to replace one of these components. And we're trying to do things a little bit differently here. The diesel, do not even guess. Diesel. Diesel. We're trying to do things a little bit differently. It's easy to buy another diesel mower, put it in the rotation, but we'll never know what the capabilities of the electric mowers are until we have one. No, I, I applaud you for doing it. I think uh, the Committee for the Environment will be happy that you're doing it. Yeah. I think it's a, it's a good idea. I think it's the wave of the future, but uh, it's just it's amazing to me you know, how far technology has come, right? Correct. Yeah. It's the demand. If, yeah. if there were, you know, interested golf courses wanting to do it, it wouldn't happen. Golf courses run the, the equipment, the equipment game. Yeah. Nobody else. Yeah. It's like California. California kind of runs the uh, miles per gallon. Yeah. Because if 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 they say, you know, we want fifty miles per gallon, twenty percent of cars sold in the United States are sold in California. It pushes the market. Yeah. yeah. It's I so the next one is Harbor Island Improvements. What this covers is a splash pad, lands and field improvements, a new bandstand with a concrete pad, color coding a basketball court, and a total playground we have. I don't think we need a new splash pad. No, I'm just kidding. Call. <laughs> I want to look behind me if he doesn't hear. We need a new splash pad. Yeah. Well, is this, a, is this additional? We're expanding it or, or we're just replacing so, it? What we're going to do is basically from the playground back, mm -hmm. it's a total renovation of that whole area. So what happens now is the lands of field. Lands of field is pitched four inches in the opposite direction, which means it's pitched towards the playground. Now, when it rains, the water play runoff ends up in the playground and floods the playground out, which kids can't use the playground for four, five, six days at a time, especially the little infant area. That becomes like a swimming pool. Um, so it would be a total rip out and redo of land to, to pitch it out towards the grass, which then in turn, we could take the playground itself, expand it a little bit, 
put down safety rubber surface and put new equipment in. Take out the old equipment in? The only thing I'm planning on keeping is the gazebo that's in the middle of the playground. Everything else, that. if you look through the pictures, is rotted. It's it a wood playground. Mm -hmm. It's from 2004. Mm -hmm. We have pieces that we cannot get right now because a company in Canada bought over the company that we got that playground equipment from. So anytime we try and order something for that playground equipment, it gets held in customs. On top of that, they don't make pieces for it anymore. Right. It's outdated. No one really does wood playground equipment anymore. It's mostly, if you do find a wood structure these days, it's probably cedar, which doesn't match up with our um, timber. Third part of that is the new bandstand. Right now we have a bandstand. I couldn't even tell you how old it is. We have made repairs to it. We try and keep up with it as much as possible. It's very, very popular for the concerts in the harbor and uh, Bach to Rock and, you know, all those school programs, they use it. Uh, artistry uses it all the time. But what, what we want to do is we want to expand it so we could start using it for rainy days on camp, using it to give campers a place to eat lunch that's not in the middle of the field. It, it's covered. Uh, we want to be able to rent rent it out as a um, party rental, right now. What's the what's the rental on that? What's our? Is you're going to make it sixty by forty? What was the size? The hundred person. It's forty by twenty. Wow. Well, so what is, a, what a, is it now? It's like it's uh, twenty by twenty by fifteen. It's yeah. twenty by thirteen. I think it is. Mm -hmm. So we're we're going to be able to put about a hundred people under this structure. Would there be, uh, sorry, would there be, is there going to be storage underneath or no? So I don't want to do storage with the structure. There's possibility. I left enough room at the end of it to put our own storage in. Okay. Um, can I talk about the... Yeah. Okay. Okay. okay so I want to make sure that we know what the... Yeah. Is. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, having a hundred person structure that we could rent out and have parties in the closest bathroom to that proximity is the Marine Education Center. What about the pavilion? What about you? It's still you're walking across the fields yeah. to go into the pavilion. Someone has to let you in the pavilion to use the restroom. So there's possibly I left enough room where we could have a connectable storage oh. slash restroom out there. Near the and will this be a full fledged restroom or will this be kind of a waterless kind of situation? This will be like a waterless situation where it's, you know, we don't need to run water out yeah. to the field. We don't need to run Amazing. sewer out to the field. Many like they have all the state water. Yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's what I was right. thinking we should do. You want to talk about the right here? Yeah. So, um, so the, the, the bandstand we project, so as you know, we, Rent a deck at the harbor right next to the pavilion. It's pretty popular, I'd say, four times a weekend, plus two a day. We're doing six fifty people, and uh, last year uh, was about twenty two thousand revenue from just that fifty person pavilion deck. Uh, so we extrapolate to fifty times it by two. You're looking at forty um, two thousand a year in revenue just for that hundred person. If you do similar bookings, which we're turning people away at the deck now because that's all we have to rent, right? So we anticipate that this could pay itself off within two and a half years or so. In revenue? In revenue. It's, uh, and it will be huge for our camp. I mean, just having a shaded spot for 100 kids uh, that is not in the field, it would be terrific. You know? Or that if it's drizzling. Uh, I mean, it wouldn't work for lightning, but if it's drizzling, or mm -hmm. you could put them under there. It's just they just don't have anything covered in the harbor that can possibly get that many. So in three and four years out, it's a revenue stream. Absolutely. I'd say, I'd see year three would be a good. Okay. Would there, is our idea to have, oh, never mind. I see it. Answering the question. Okay. I, I think having a hundred person rental facility on the water is uh, invaluable. To the well, is it including is it including any benches or anything, tables? Yes, and... yes. As, uh, we expect out the picnic tables, which are in the 
in the yeah, they're in the I saw, okay. I just yeah, wasn't the, sure if it was a part of that. A twenty thousand dollar plus expense picnic commercial mm -hmm. picnic tables aren't cheap, so yeah, Jeez, that's all going there. Like these next year, time. Yeah. I would like to have a refrigerator because when we do parties, uh, we need a refrigerated space, people, have cakes, they got whatever. So right now we have that stuff in the pavilion when we do the parties, mm -hmm. but. If we the storage area check and work on it, I think it's going to be helpful for everyone. Thank you. You're welcome. Any questions on the? No. Bandband? This seems very well thought out. The next, we're going to go to the splash pad. So, I'd say about a month into the season this year, we lost the splash pad for two or three days. Two or three days. So the inner workings of the splash pad are totally rotted out. They're solenoids? The solenoids, the valves, the copper piping, the electrical unit that's underground, the wires that go to the splash pad, the wires that turn the splash pad on and off, the sensors that turn the splash pad on and off, the, main office. the box in the main office, everything is beyond repairable, which in then turned us to just having to have to switch it on and off. There was no break if no one was in it. What was the reason why this happened? It just, it's all underground equipment that salt water has been there for 20 years. 20 years. It's all the big lines. Leilani, the mechanics are in the pit. Okay. Underground. They're on the ground. Yeah, they're, they're, on the ground. they're about three feet below the beach level. So even when we don't flood, we get groundwater in the harbor all the time. The pit's always full. Okay. Um, it's very outdated. We have no pressure. Yeah. Time clocks don't work. Like I said, it's basically just an on and off piece of equipment right now. Um, I don't want to interrupt because I think our water bill was about 40% higher this year because of that. Injury. It was higher last year. Yeah. And we had to turn it on and then not be able to, because it had this mechanism. It had a sensor when no the kids activity. weren't in it. There's no activity. It shuts itself down. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we, um, Budget forty thousand dollars a year just for utilities and spray ground water. This year we're at about fifty three more. Yeah. Fifty three. Um which is issues are one of the main issues. The other thing is it's on all the time, seven days per week, nine AM to five PM, and it's constantly being used, especially when yeah, it's packed. Packed, overcrowded. Not overcrowded, I don't want us to use that word, but well. Well used. It's low. Well used. It's low. And when you when your beach is close for swimming, when it's 90 degrees out 20% of the summer, you need something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Of course. We need something that's reliable and we need something that's functional. Um, and we need something that when I come into work in the morning, I'm not getting screamed at because 300 kids can't use it because parts are down. Now I'm taking lawn sprinklers out and hoses and <laughs> Yeah, so oh, thanks. So we had replaced a bunch of the fixtures. Can we reuse those? It's, it's just it's just the it's so two the, of the two of the fixtures can be retrofitted for a new system. Mm -hmm. the, the new uh, ones. The, the new ones, the seahorse and the palm tree, those mm -hmm. are going to be retrofitted into the new spray ground. Everything else is outdated and obsolete. It doesn't work off the same system. How much bigger is it gonna be? It's almost gonna be double the size. Excellent. Wow. Back to the original size. Yes. So it's going to be the light pole, right, Jeff? Where it is now? It's going to be. It's going to be almost up to the light pole. It's going to have different areas, like a playground does. It's going to have a small infant area. It's going to have a three to five range. It's going to have a five to seven range, and it's going to have a seven to twelve range. It's going to be lighted, so we can use it at night. We can use it on TV night. We can have parties on the beach. Should be smart. Keep it up. Keep it open a little later. Um, also, we're taking all the mechanics and bringing them above ground. It's what in its own separate box. Nothing's going to sit in water. Um, yeah, and that's basically it. We're basically going to double the size. Um, to 22 or 23 years ago, <clears throat> Mr. Recker and myself uh, back there worked uh, very hard to lobby people to get that spray ground put in. Yeah, I, I, and, was, I was amazed that it was controversial. Yeah, life's always oh, good. <laughs> and uh, it, it, it warmed the old Irish heart to see my grandson playing in it this year. So so the new the new plan that me and Jason would like to go with is, 
So I don't know if anybody's ever been to a water park and they have that big bucket that fills and then mm -hmm. after a while it dumps on the kids. Yeah. Uh, this this spray ground is a little more interactive. There's little stars on the ground that the smaller kids could step on and the water shoots up in the sky. So it's it's, it's big a little, kids too. Yeah, adults too. <laughs> it's just a little more interactive for for one of the biggest destinations in Harbor Island. Because a lot of people just come for the spray ground. They don't come for the beach. They don't come for the fields. They just come to let their kids run around in water in a closed area. The under eight crowd. Yeah, and, and just hang out. It's spectacular. Yeah. I, I think it's important to note that these improvements are done. I think you're going to see our revenues and our daily parking revenues and our beach revenues go like this. Mm -hmm. I you build it, they will come. You yeah. know, that's sort of thing. And I think we're not asking for six flags. We're just asking to make our little community. So, so if, if we approve this, when could this thing be put in? So if we approve the whole, sorry, if we approve the whole plan, we're looking at a 24, 25 install. Okay. Because, because there's multiple moving pieces to this improvement, Playground, Lanza, Bandstand, Spray Grounds. I want to get everybody on the same page and kind of just close that area once. Get it done with. This way, we only have to figure out what to do with soccer, baseball, softball, and everybody using one the beach, beach at one period of time yeah. and not having an extended down period. Because even though the splash pad could be worked on, we're going to be building a bandstand right next to the beach. No one's going to want to be next to the beach while there's cement trucks and carpentry going on and, and sheet metal being done. We could do the playground, but if we don't fix Lanza and the flooding issues that Lanza creates for the playground, then we're still going to have the same problem. The clay is going to end up on the newly poured rubber surface. So we want to go from the playground right to the water. playground to the water. Yeah. And, and, he's facing, he's and can we do it in the shoulder season uh, and not lose uh, a lot of... Uh, warm weather youth. So what I'm going, what I'm trying to shoot for is doing it in a fall season, the whole thing. Um, I don't know if that's possible because I don't know how far this is going to go. So I don't want to start, you know, I'd love to start scheduling people. Listen, come next October, you're mine, you're mine, you're mine. We're just going to all work together and do this. Um, but I'm shooting for a fall season. So it's as minimal of an impact. <clears throat> We're talking next fall? Next fall. Next fall construction. Yes. No, okay. The fall is almost off here. Yes. What, yeah, fall will time. this double the water usage or will it be more efficient than the current size? It it's gonna be more efficient because it's a it's a it's a little bit of a different operating system. Mm -hmm. So right now the wall sprays have to be on with the floor sprays. The tree has to be on with the rainbow sprays. This everything, everything is separate. So the stars don't spray water unless you go and step on them. The bucket won't fill unless the, the bucket system is on. The uh, seahorse won't be going the same time as something that's not being used on the other side of the park. So right now, someone might be in the wall spray, but they might not be in the seahorse. The seahorse is running when it doesn't need to be running. This new system is all individually synchronized pieces of equipment. So I believe the only thing that stays constant when it's on is the bucket fill. But then if no one's using the bucket fill, the bucket doesn't empty. So it's a little, hmm. it's a little more water friendlier than yes. So maybe Maybe I've asked, I don't know if I've asked this before, but have we ever had past the issue at the playground where there's too many kids on there? Or uh we I mean I could only speak for what I've seen, but we've had little kids run into each other because it's you know they're in a tight, they're excited, you know, water's in their eyes, and then you know you get a head-on collision because yeah, well during camp, uh a lot of people don't want to come because the camp takes up a large portion of it. So yeah. Crowded. So they won't pay the daily, you're saying? They just won't come? Correct. Or they'll come after three. Okay. Because uh, 
you know, when you have your four year old and you have 25. Yeah. They want to deal with kindergartners, right? Yeah. And, you, yeah. and we can't recycle the water because the Board of Health won't let us do that. Correct. Yeah, we tried. We looked into it. it uh, yeah. We also can't recycle the water because we don't have a big enough water supply to recycle. Mm -hmm. So we, we we spec'd out two different systems, a water recycle mm -hmm. and a system like we have now. The problem is our supply water is not big enough to run a recycled system. We don't have enough pressure and we don't have enough gallons per minute coming into the harbor. Now, take account everybody using bathrooms, plus water in the field. Mm -hmm. Our water pressure goes from about 85 down to 60 at the spray, spray ground at any given time. So we don't have enough pressure. We've no dedicated, it's not a dedicated line. So we can't. what we would have to do is dig up the harbor from the spray ground all the way up the Boston Post Road and put in a four inch line. And, and then you still don't know if the county would let you. you then after that, it's all up to the county because now you're getting into chlorinated water, and chemicals. You would need an engineer to run that system. You can't use salt water. I mean, I'm just, I'm just those. It's not like we could take advantage of Long Island Sound. You can't use salt water for those so pieces of equipment. Our water is brackish, so it's not ideal. Um, it's not like a cruise ship. You can use salt water mm -hmm. certain New York City or mm -hmm. on certain island pools that are salt water, but. It, yeah, it's not practical. And if, for us. and if the beach is closed for health reasons, right, you, you can't use that water anyway, yeah. right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah, it would be that would be cool. So we, you know, I think the filtration thing is would be wonderful, but it would the health department needs some sort of depth. We don't have depth. And you need a big area to hold it. You, you need a holding depth. time. You need mm -hmm. the you need as you as you recycle right. the water, you need um, to hold it for a long time with chlorination. Uh, also, you know, people tell me, oh, you have UV light systems, doesn't do it. I don't see a pool that runs on UV light, so it's not possible. Any questions about Harbor Island? It sounds it sounds a basketball court a part of part of Harbor Island. Mm -hmm. Next time. The basketball court is a separate piece of a future capital plan because so we it, it was because it was in the it was in our um our packet so i was just wondering if we just skipping over it or we gonna do no, it that's so so what we did um oh the camp, maybe i'm looking at the, the camp paper. children were playing basketball on the pavers and on the grass so what we did is we kind of built a half court basketball area for the campers out near the bandstand mm -hmm. just so they could play basketball on it kickball, box ball, whatever the campers want to do on a blacktop surface. That's the basketball court that's getting painted in this proposal. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. You paint the half court? Yeah. Yeah, because it prolongs the blacktop. Uh, we could do multiple line paintings on it. They don't have to set up cones every day. Everything will be down. I mean, since we built that court, that temporary court, I mean, it was probably the biggest used spot other than the beach and the spray room. Oh, no, it's a hero. So we do have in our plan, Ronnie, um, behind the parks building, behind Jeff's maintenance building, after the county pier project is completed, to move in and do basketball courts there and, and expand our volleyball courts because we make a lot of money on volleyball. Yes. Yeah. So um, we're moving a basketball court for kids near where you have that huge tower. Near the tower, yeah. Yeah. That's so it's not in this plan or proposal, but it will be next year. Is there another location for a basketball court mm -hmm. or basketball courts? It will. It could there be another location outside of that well, space? It's not right near that tower. So okay. if you go into Harbor, you know where we have the concerts. Mm -hmm. You know where our parks garage is. Mm -hmm. You know that little muddy area that no one uses. Yes, it was where, the, where, the where I found was. you during the the auto show. Yes, got it. Yes. Okay, so that's a very under okay then. Area of okay, Harvard, that if we do take that area for basketball courts, it doesn't affect any anything. Other got it. it. Doesn't affect baseball, soccer, no, nothing. nothing. You're right. I was just trying to no, figure out the scope because I'm like that. That tower is actually behind my building, a little more closer to the water. It's not. It's in close proximity, but we're not right under it if we if we put that. you guys are. Well, yeah. we are. Which is dangerous. Oh. 
Florence. Florence Park. So in Florence Park, we are looking to do a total renovation, uh, total equipment replacement, site prep, tear out and redo tennis courts, tear out and redo basketball courts, tear out and redo the walkways and the curbing, add pickleball courts, and replace all electrical fixtures with LED fixtures and um, furnishings. Right now, there's no, there's only, I think, three benches around the playground equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not even close to what we need over there. Mm -hmm. uh, besides the harbor, Florence Park is our other most popular park. Um, if you looked at the pictures I sent around, there's a lot of safety issues in Florence Park. Uh, trees, uplifting curbs, uplifting walkways, uplifting the tennis court. The tennis courts aren't really used because there's so many tree roots under them. They're all cracked. The basketball court's sinking. It's cracked. It already went through a renovation about 10 years ago? No. no, it was the same thing. About 10 years ago. Uh, they didn't do it the right way. They kind of just filled in the basketball court that was there and painted new lines on it. They never redid the drainage. They never took care of any of the tree issues. Um, there's a lot of, like I said, there's a lot of tripping hazards for little kids. A lot of kids ride their scooters and their bikes yes. and skateboard in that park. And it's just a recipe for disaster. A lot of kids learn how to ride their bike there. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, also, we're going to do ported rubber surface. Um, that would need the most amount of work because we have ported rubber surface there already. It wasn't properly installed the first time. So when you go on that playground, um, number one, the rubber surface is lifting up. Yeah. Number two, there's a lot of sinkholes underneath the rubber surface oh, yeah. that when you step on it, it kind of creates a uh, a fall and you end up, you know, falling flat on your face. Uh, the equipment's probably from 2000, late 90s, 2000? 2000. 2001, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of the rubber surfacing started to peel away and uh, there's metal that's exposed that heats up in the sun that, you know, is hot to little kids' skin. Um, so, so I want to say something about the uh, courts, the tennis courts, that Jason and I had a conversation during COVID. I had to kick out private contractors, quote unquote, uh, for doing uh, programming there without an approval. That's uh, something you really um, I don't hide anything, but um, Jason and I have talked about potentially of programming the tennis courts to make sure that um, we add that program to the community. I understand that we have sport time and all of that stuff, but um, we have talked about that uh, up to and including an additional tennis court that's at the uh, Arbor Island Park somewhere. Yeah, the pickleball has been a big thing, so if we want to make it to a purpose court. Um, I get a lot of requests. The two main ones, believe it or not, are can you please build pickleball courts and can you please refurbish Florence Park? Out of all the things I get, yeah. so those are the two main ones for some reason pickleball and refurbish Florence Park. Yeah, I hear about Florence Park. Um, yeah, it's in rough shape. So uh, as part of that component, we talked about possibly in the future having some sort of tennis membership like they do at Memorial Park in the town. Yeah. Small year pass, you have it scheduled. That's a contract, right? right? Uh, a contract yes, they do an RFP. Yeah, they do an RFP. So, uh, so just thoughts on how we can utilize the park better. As a, as would that be a revenue source? That would matter if if we so desire to, to do that in that park. It's, but there's options. Um, I, I'm after just reviewing this, it's for the basketball court. It's adding one other court, correct? It's it's refurbishing or re. Currently, we have two courts. Those would be ripped out and redone, start to finish, okay. and then adding an additional basketball court, which would give us three full size courts, and then adding an additional three pickleball courts, opposite of tennis. This way, people can still play tennis and people can still play pickleball without battling over two courts. And I, my only, I don't know if it was, I see it in here, but I know, for example, I, I, at Columbus, there used to be this kind of padding under the the backboard or the rim. Is that something we could, that we would purchase or like them when they redo the courts, they would go in and install? No, that would, that would all be 
covered under the, the new. Okay. But what happens is you have kids who think they could dunk mm -hmm. and, and they, they get hurt. Yeah, you have grab on it to it and they don't realize it's foam. It's only held in by, you know, little quarter inch screws. Yeah. It just rips right off. I was one of those kids. <laughs> and my question for Jason, could we pro, I know we're talking about programming for tennis. Like, could we program those courts if they're, after they're redone? I know that's for Jason, but I I, I would love to. And yeah, I just think we should, if we're looking to program and do something with pickleball or, or tennis at those courts, why I I think we should look to do the same thing because three, these it'll guys, be three courts back to back. These guys live in that neighborhood. Yeah. So. yeah. I'm just, I don't my know question is, repeat, yeah, my question is that could we program those courts once that is done? Correct. That's what I was getting at when I said that we've been working internally on if we can get these courts done, here's some sort of fee schedule on how we can program them. Mm -hmm. um, Basketball, yeah, we could do an adult basketball. Yeah, I just yeah, think we could do a youth basketball league there, along with Columbus. You know, because Columbus's basketball court's really nice, it's lit. We could yeah. use both parks. So yes. Thank you. Yeah, we talk about revenue all the time, Jason and I. Yeah, and the facilities that we have. I could, if I could put tolls on the roads, I put tolls on the roads. Right? <laughs> so, so what what happens is it's impossible for us to program facilities that look and are in that condition, yeah. right? We just can't do it. So we've been we've been held up by, by being, able being able to do that. I'll put it this way. So we don't um, internally, when we bring this to Jerry, he says, great, are you going to make money? Even, is there going to be revenue? You <laughs> know, so, so like it's what we think about when we do this stuff. Look for ideas to help bring down the costs in the long term. And then also, uh, the I know it says like we're improving the lights. Is this just like the lights along the path, or is this the lights around the court, or will so, be adding lights around the court? So there's two different costs here. One one's the Florence Park Improvements page, and the other one's the CIP. Mm -hmm. That's for discussion of lights on the tennis court, lights on the basketball courts, lights on the pickleball courts, uh, lights over the playground, uh, adding more lights because. There's some dark spots in there, mm -hmm. yeah. and Mayor Murphy can contest to that. He scared me one night when the power was out. <laughs> you know, you scared him. Well, I'm scared of the dark. That's oh, why. Yeah, he was. Uh, you know, I, I, got, I, I walked in on him when he was trying to fix it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so the reason why I had my meter, price, I was ready to go. The reason why there's two pricing is number one, you never know what you're going to find out when you start ripping stuff apart, and number yeah. two, I left the option in there to expand the infrastructure of the park, whether that's a couple solar lights, regular LEDs, or simple walkway lights. Yeah. Uh, like walkway lights from the bottom up, you mean? Yeah. So yeah. like around the playground, we could install lights on the walls, Yeah. around the front near the little electrical closet. And, and so right. some of that idea is because we want to reduce the heat, because we have we neighbor. Have, we have um, houses surrounding the entire yeah. park. So we want to reduce the, the light lead or the, the light pollution mm -hmm. that people would uh, be upset about. But right, you don't want them up high. No, mm -hmm. we don't, we, if we can't, if we can't, and we, if want, we can avoid it. Mm -hmm. We want them shining in the park mm -hmm. instead of- Out to the-, the Out windows. windows. Into yeah. everybody's windows. Similar to the Harbor Island Park LED project, if you notice there's no deleting. Yeah. You can't even know they're on, that's your advantage. Yeah. So the technology's gone. And I know we're removing trees. Are, are, is the goal over the time for like us internally to replant and- to put different so, types of trees so they don't rip up the court in the future. Or we we, we always plant? we always and will always plant trees. Uh, the problem is, you know, however many years ago those trees were planted, they planted them right on top of the courts. Yeah. We will rebuild the park and then plan where we should plant trees where they won't interfere with our infrastructure. And for many, if you have seen, if, so in other parks, if you've seen planters with trees in them, mm -hmm. it's because they don't want to ruin the surface, right? No, it's a great. That's, that's one idea, but also if we need shade at some point, because I think the, the intent was, was the, you know, good intentions of just putting trees near the surfaces so that they can pull them down, but for us, it just doesn't work. We can put shade structures if we need to. Um. Because we've lost a lot of trees in that park over the last few years. Yeah. Tough. It's a tough environment. As it's a wet feet and everything. As we as we plan ahead, though, is there is there a, um, uh, we have an eye toward putting some equipment for um, senior citizens for for for, uh, for you know so, something that 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 so older this, people could use that is, that is not sort of you know that is, that this, is designed for them. 
This Florence Park project is basically from the track to the playground equipment. Mm -hmm. it, it, besides the lighting, it has nothing to do with around the track. Uh -huh. Later on down the road, it would be nice to see like a fitness um, a trail. Trail. Yes. So a couple of uh, weighted, body weighted pieces of equipment around the walking path because a lot of people use the walking path to, for exercise. Exactly. In the park no. for exercise. And I think it's a perfect area just to drop a couple pieces of equipment in around the track for people who want to work out and use their own body weight. Would that be appropriate also at a Harbor Island? That would be appropriate at Harbor Island along the seawall, I would believe. This way it's out of the way of the playing fields. This way people who walk around the seawall could stop at each station and, you know, do what they want to do. And, and it's not really... It's not really taking away space from anything else. Yeah. So they can be temporary stations around the seawall. Mm -hmm. The seawall is going to have a major. major yeah, I know. I, I remember that. Because I, I know, you know, periodically it comes up, you know, exercise equipment for old people, and and then then it then goes away. It doesn't, and it hasn't gone away. It's just yeah. The right. users of the park, each park is different. Yeah. Jefferson Park experiences a lot of young. Children, mm -hmm. not a lot of seniors go to yeah. that park. There's no reason to put equipment in that park. Okay. Columbus Park, Harbor Island, Florence Park. I could see those parks being used with some equipment stations around the park. Stanley Avenue Park is another thing. Young children. I don't really see seniors yeah. going there to work out. Um, it's basically the bigger parks with the walking space that I was imagining putting equipment in. This isn't touching the field either, correct? This is not touching the field okay. either. So, so Lou, those stations are four to six thousand dollars each. They're not a lot of money, but it could add up if you wanted to add up to multiple parts. Sure. It could add up to All right. I mean, I, I just remember that uh, yeah. that in, at several forums it came up, and everybody's everybody loves the idea, and then I don't see it. But it's something we could yeah. buy one piece of equipment for, put it in the park. It's not it's not something we have to do as a group. We okay. Can do one piece of equipment per year. Right. And in four or five years now, you have four or five pieces of equipment I around would, the track. I, yeah, would like, like, I would like to test it in Florence, see how well it does, monitor and check it out, see what kind of use it's getting, prove the need, and then expand it. Florence Park. Yeah, Florence I think Park the two biggest thing our seniors ask for are pickleball and a flat surface at the harbor that they can walk around. That's, mm -hmm. You know, the harbor has a lot of pave, but it's not always flat. Not always <laughs> flat. <laughs> you can pave, so. <laughs> the only, uh, is this your last, are you done? Yeah. Okay, so my only um, suggestion would be when things are, because I understand that a lot of these things are just really need-based, like not even a want. Um, when you start thinking about things for the future, I just, I hope that we're keeping our teens in mind because we they do not have space for anything. We have, we're, we're catering to a, and rightfully so, a, a younger age, a, in, like infant, toddler, uh, elementary, maybe middle school, but our teens in high school age, we don't have anything for them. So when we, we are thinking and we are being creative as you have been, as both of you have been, you know, just really thinking about our, our teenage um, age youth. I, I agree with you. I just don't think that's going to be solved via playground. There's yeah, no, it, it could be, but it could be indoor space, huge, yeah, and different outdoor activities in open spaces, of course. But huge. you guys know the I, area best when it comes down to rec and, and the park usage and any other spaces, you know, you guys know best because this is your job. So I'm just saying, keep it in mind and really thinking creatively um, on how to do that. I just think, I agree. I just think these things have these improvements need to be tied to like increased programming because I feel like if we, if you said like you're Nobody's going to want to run a program for tennis at Florence the way, the way the court looks or run a basketball program there. But I think as we kind of renovate and make these things like state of the art and improved, like we should be really pushing to find and, to find and develop those partners now to kind of get the interest of knowing that, hey, this would be a really great kind of outdoor court. Like at what programming could you offer here through the village? So, so a lot of it is just having the facilities and creating the environment. So this is our first step. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I don't really talk to them about the design of the playground, what it looks like, what colors, what facilities. I truly don't talk to them about that. I just talk to them about the payback 
of the funding and the bonding, as well as the future revenue. That's all we talked about. Um, there are a lot more with Jason than with Jeff. With Jeff, I talked about other things that cost money and save money, but um, really that, that's what it's all about. We just can't, like we just can't do it, right? I've asked many times about the Warren Avenue tennis court, right? mm -hmm. but it's, how do I set up programming on one court mm -hmm. when you just can't really- but you can't even see it from the street. Too. And you can't see it from the street and it's it's just by itself out okay. there. Oh. So it's hard, it's a hard situation for us uh, without the multiple courts and the um, facilities being repeated at a location so we can have an actual program with multiple people. Warren is by me, right? Yeah. So yeah. What, can, at some point, can y'all do something? Um, because there's a lot of people who use that as a track and it's so uneven, but just keep it in mind. It's in mind. I've had a conversation <laughs> with Gino before. Uh, we were trying to get it done when we did all the paving. Mm -hmm. It just couldn't happen. Mm -hmm. But it's it's on the list and it's on the radar to be redone, resurfaced. If uh, Mayor Murphy, with Kathleen and Trustee Lucas, probably recall, we partnered with Florence Parker, the paving contract. Was, and that's how we got Florence Parker. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can do that again mm -hmm. as an app. We tried for this year, it just the timing didn't work. So that happens. It's, it's on the radar. It's just, it's, it's, as long it's, as it's on the radar. This is kind of off uh, base a little bit, but didn't, I mean, when you guys, you, for you folks who grew up here, when you were in high school, did, and you, because Lilani made me think about this when she talked about teenagers, did they have dances and stuff for the kids? Yes, we had a lot of different options when yeah. we were our teenagers, whether yeah. between Largemont or M Village of Romantic. Nothing town really didn't have anything. I don't think they had that. I mean, I they don't have, have anything. That's, that's yeah, what yeah. I did down at the pavilion. We had the Coles. We had and also school dances, which they don't allow anymore. Yeah, um, and the, and just, the just fear of a lot of things happening in the world, and that they just stopped and it, things just stopped and right you know understandably so but it just became and then when we didn't have a movie theater that just took away a lot um yeah, that was like my so nice. you, ha you, had to you, you had a lot of things for the teenagers and then you had you had spaces like the cap center and that had a lot of teen programs um that we don't necessarily have and then we just we slowly over time have get taken away we've taken away and not yep. replaced so, but when we do have let's say we do have an indoor space in the next few years right there'll be courts there there'll be synthetic turf there'll be areas where people can potentially you know exercise and use the facility but there'll also be rooms full of computers and screens right and then because places for have that because if not i'm not going to attract the teens that also want to do that recreationally and socializing with that kind of uh, with that kind of environment as well. Right, because you have a lot of teens who are interested in gaming. You have teens so who are interested different. in art. Yeah. You it's have, you know, we need a multi-purposeful space. It's like, well, I, we just need a space to do it. Yeah, yeah I, I get it. Those two things, I mean, my team can do pretty much anything you could dream of. We just need a little bit more. Okay, thank you. Thanks for all the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was a lot of time. Thank you. Is that it for the capital? I told you the password. Nice, nice to deal with this actual uh, stuff that's happening. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's <laughs> very, you know, very uh, hopeful. You know, I think we spent a lot of years oh, atrophying. Yeah. 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 So, Mayor, I forgot about the on the regular meeting. Uh, there's another vehicle for the building department. I'm not sure if you want to talk Let's about do it that. Now. We'll do that now, and then there's <laughs> phase four. Yes, phase four. Talk about the docks, talk about the plants, talk about the fishing pier idea. Oh, fun. So, this year, I want to start phase four for the dock rebuild. We were planning on doing this in six, but I should be able to actually get it done in five. With this being four, next year I'll just do the fishing pier and the ramp docks that are the only ones left. Because this year we're going to do C dock, the police dock, and S dock. That's pretty much all. So once again, Jeff, it's material only. It's material only because we're building a Dawson house. Just the material, the lumber and hardware. It's pressure treated. Pressure treated. Good night, Colin.
Thank you, Carlos. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> he, he had planned to come yell at us, and he decided that he's he satisfied. <laughs> All the hardware and source. And the, the 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 recent storm didn't do that much damage to the dock. No, we only lost one one dock in the last one. <laughs> That was the end at the end of the mine. I think that's the property. Oh, the one that went parallel to the wall? The one that, well, it's the one that the gangway, the hand yeah, 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 gangway yeah. lands on. It's, that's the one that got banged up pretty good. Was it old? Yeah, that was one of the old ones. What, it, debris hit it? What happened? The debris piled up against it. Yeah. One of the floors off the inside. Yeah, it was on like a fire hose there. Yeah. And then the fishing pier, which is something, obviously, because it's um, not rented or we don't really very charge for it. That's on the last portion of it. So that'll be phase five. That'll be phase five. five and that's, that's, mm -hmm. It gets a lot of use. Yeah. It's nice to get a little uh, little hawk fin thing going down there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's a fish bear. Carolina. Thanks, Jeff. Well, Thanks for the, 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 yeah. the docks look great. Yeah. Yeah, they're really good. Oh, she's going to retire. We're going to vote. Good evening, everybody. Hi. Board. Um, so the good news is that the less free capital improvement projects that we presented last year, one of them is complete. It was a renovation of the heating department. So that's huge. The second one, I'm oh, sorry, that one is complete, but we still have a phase two that we discussed before, which is the storage. Right now, currently, the storage for the building department for our property files is in a different location. We were considering bringing it upstairs to be added, but I don't think that's viable. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's still in the makings. Mm -hmm. So it's at, it's at 650 Holstead? Yeah. Correct. Mm -hmm. So right now, that entails a lot of logistic. Our folders have to be brought to 169 Mount Pleasant in a car and then be brought up upstairs, right? So it's a lot of logistic involved. Ideally, we would plan for the phase two of the capital improvement project to be able to bring to this building. But since we are planning on a renovation, that is on hold for me. So fingers crossed. Yeah. Um, the item number two that we had, the capital improvement project for security camera, that is also complete. So thank you for that. And the number three is for our fleet. We are slowly replacing our cars. The average age is 15 years old on the cars. So we are looking for one new car by the end of the year, which is an electric vehicle. Replacing there would be um, an auction. One yeah, we'll auction it off. Yeah. Yes. So that's what we have to present for now. Everything else. Okay, and the car you're the the car that you're position. replacing is it 2007? Yes, that's good. Not the focus. Yeah, one focus. So, so you use the you're the predominant user of the electric car. Mm -hmm. Explain a little bit about some of the use and how you like it so far. Thank you, Jerry. So. I am the first person using an electric vehicle in our department, and it was a very positive change, not only because we're not having to charge this car with the fuel, right? So it's completely uh, free for the village. One of the stations, we didn't have to pay anything to charge that car, so it's free for the village. And on top of that, we feel we're being able to give back to the environment, so the zero pollution. Um, it's all positive, it runs perfectly, and it does what it needs to do, right? We are extremely happy with that change. What's your average charging? How many times so, a month or a week? So it's a total of 280 miles that we can run with that car in a good range. Uh, if you think about it, that will be every other week for the charge. Which yeah. is pretty significant. Mm -hmm. The change will be a big impact. As we go forward with this update, and you're not buying fuel. And we're not buying fuel. We have one station now, so hopefully that station will be fixed mm -hmm. soon. And uh, I believe the the chief also uses an electric vehicle. I'm mm -hmm. happy with that. 
it's, it's extremely healthy to so know that yours. We will have one station put in for the vehicle. That does not sense. So in order to prevent that we will run out of battery, we try to charge it as often as possible because of the emergency situations. We try to have it and charge it as often as possible. And that's it. That's all I have to present. Uh, one thing, if I may, Mayor, um, uh, today, today I was I just happened to be talking to a, a business owner who's preparing a business on Mamaroneck Avenue, and uh, he was lamenting the fact that uh, Canada said was taking some time getting three phase power to his business. I said, oh, it's too bad. And he says, volunteer totally, but the building department in the village has been awesome. And, I, and I'm and i like, well, because I'll tell you in, in, in the year I've been doing this, that was not what I used to hear <laughs> when I first started. So so it, 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 it was, it made me smile. You know, I mean, you don't, you just get, he was just thrilled. You know? Thank you so much for that, that means a lot. Still, it's teamwork. I couldn't be doing that by myself. Mm -hmm. Not only the staff has been working extremely hard, but one thing I tell everybody is that this can only be done thanks to the support of our village manager, mayor, and the trustees. It's really a teamwork that is only viable thanks to all of you. Well, and it you. makes a big difference to work uh, in this environment. So I appreciate all the hard work is worth well, at least one one person you helped is was delighted. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Any questions? No. no. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Nice. Um. Okay. You no. Know, the the one item that the chief is still here for, uh, is uh, the canine insurance after retirement. Uh, chief, do you have new information for us? So I believe he had spoken up to the prior meeting mm -hmm. and Bob is going to do some investigating about um, some of the questions that you had had. I need to invest into my so here some of the it's gonna be uh, legality of the village providing health insurance for United officers mm -hmm. after they have uh, been retired, and there's actually no authority for the village to do that. Um, you know, I say this as a dog lover, I told my own dogs and most dogs, mm -hmm. but dogs in the episode were lost their property. And just as you couldn't give away a village vehicle and change for insurance for it, you can't lawfully pay for insurance for the dog after the dog has uh, <clears throat> been retired. It's no longer in service. <clears throat> I mean, the only the exception is that in the West, the village can't give away money. If there was some contractual basis for doing so, there's the only way you can do that. So we do not consider canines employees when they're in service. No, not. What are they? What are you considering? So equipment? Uh, it's, I would guess yeah, probably. Not all. It's not considered the property. However, they are considered a canine partner or a member of service when they are working. So service. Yep. Okay. So, and you mentioned other, um, in, in other communities, people have done this. So, right. So what, well, what I looked at is I looked at four different communities. Mm -hmm. So out of the four different communities, there's one out of the four that pays after they retire. Mm -hmm. And there are two of the four that have insurance for their active. And that's just based on four municipalities that I've looked at. And, and where was that one municipality? That pays after they retire? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Harrison. Yes. Oh, well. So, mm -hmm. so they found the authority. 
They, yeah, they did. Or they just did. Or they just did. Or, or is it? Have you suggested so that would have to be something that would be part of the PBA negotiations as part of the contract that they would have to negotiate that as part of the contract. I, I was suggesting that it might be a, a it might be a, a job for the PBA. Well, what you could do. If you wanted to, was make it a contractual requirement for the officer who was the canine's partner to take care of the canine after the canine was retired. And you can, I believe they get a stipend in that, right, Chief? So, officers? right. So while they are working, they get a stipend for the care and the maintenance of the dog. So Once they retire, they, they do not get. And as a term of the as a condition of getting the stipend while the canine is in service, the officer would have to obligate himself or herself to take care of the dog after the dog had retired, and the village could agree to pay to ensure that it will be part of the contract with the officer. With the officer, but we, that we would, would have to be that would be subject to collective bargaining. And, and we wouldn't care where the dog lives. I mean, as long as the officer would, would, would take care of the details on it, right? I suppose. Yeah. When, once an officer, you know, is a canine officer and has that well, that dog as a partner, yeah, they, they're bonded. You cannot, even if the officer mm. you can't give that dog to another canine okay. officer because they bonded with that officer, okay. and the the officer would never not take his. That's what was going to be my and question. How is how is that officer chosen? Is that a, is that a volunteer position yeah. or it's like you know they say okay I would like to step up and be. Um, the officer who works with the canine dog. So what we do, what I do is I have interviews. Okay. I ask for anyone who's interested to submit a memo to me if they're interested, and then I have interviews with some of my command staff, and we make a decision who would be the best fit in the department for that position. So we, we could we could make that part of the next contract going forward. Maybe if we want to include that, is mm -hmm. that something we could do? Mm -hmm. We would have to agree. Yeah. yeah. Is can the are we obligating the police officer to pay for the insurance or are we can we obligate the village? I think that's the Leslie Lonnie's. I think we have to obligate the police officer to care for the dog. Mm -hmm. He already does. But right. Yeah. Once, What's the, once the police officer, but as part of the compensation for service while the dog is in service, insurance could go on. Pay the dog after service, provided the village provides insurance. So it would be part of the whole package. Okay. Right. I think that should be added. Yeah. And so why should it be a burden on the officer uh, to if the dog to, to care for the dog that's that's that served the village? I mean, it's, exactly. it, would, it would make sense. That would make sense. So, so you can unless unless you put into the collective bargaining agreements anything that breaks state or federal law, you can put anything into a collective bargaining agreement. There's a lot of creative things that go into a collective bargaining agreements. So there wouldn't be a uh, there wouldn't be anything holding you back from considering something like that. Right. Whether I'm going to do it or not, I don't disclose that information. But the reality is, you can you can add creative things into the CBA without worrying about. Okay, you know, All right. Right. Well, then let's leave it there. And then the clause would just come down to identifying a plan and how much the village would want to spend per year after that dog retires. And again, knowing that a dog, hopefully and hopefully from eight to ten years, a dog is working. So then any time after that, a normal lifespan for a dog, you know, after that would be you know, maybe three to five years. Mm -hmm. So that's how long you would have to incur that cost if you decide to do it. I think we should. What's the next steps? So the current contract is doesn't expire until 2025. So negotiations start usually at the beginning of that year. So probably in January of 2025 is when those negotiations would start. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, see, one uh, A is going to be held. Thank you, guys. One B is going to be held. Good night. I see, we just did. Uh, Fireman's Carnival Parade, Manager's Office. This is just the uh, eight states. Anybody have any problems with the dates that they want? Request different dates, different year. Hmm. It's on a it's an it's not a Tuesday night this year. Right. A little funny. Yeah. Huh. I mean I don't think it'll limit the attendance. No, yes, everybody, loves it. everybody loves it. 
All right, everybody fine with the times and dates? Mm -hmm. Okay. And it doesn't affect camp, right? No, it won't, because it's, it's a, no, you have to have the time. It's right starts, then camp gets shifted over. Yeah, okay. Oh, it says the parade here is Friday, right? Yeah. Okay. The okay. Fourth of July is a Thursday, Thursday, but the parade is a Friday, and it's usually on a Tuesday. Yeah. Uh, records management fees. Jerry, third party scanning service. I can. I can. No, Carolina is here. I'm the two C. Yeah, I mean it's basically. Um, uh, when we need to have items sent out for copying, uh, we're not receiving, we're not being compensated for that by the applicant. This would establish a fee for the actual cost of production and our cost for the personnel spending time to oversee and confirm everything's done. It's yeah, kind of yeah. yes. Um, so sometimes the department receives requests from people leaving necessarily nearby, so they ask us to send everything on a pen drive or on an email and we enable you to provide that information is quite effective. We can charge as per New York State, we are allowed to charge for the copies. So this service would be they would pay directly the copy or scanning company, but they would pay a fee for us to manage that sending out and receiving it back because we will have to check if that box comes back with all of the items that were sent out. So that tracking is what we're asking. What are we asking? $35? Yeah, I think that's what you've uh, proposed. Is this for FOIL requests? It's not FOIL request. And uh, we call it a request for view form. Now, one example, this is started because we had a request on a property file that is a total of five boxes. So if we were laying out five full boxes the size of this table, full of documents and drawings. So it would take someone probably a week to go through that scan and save and so, drive. Nor this is um, <clears throat> part of our mission to close open permits. Mm -hmm. And that example is part of that. Is it $35 per copy or $35 no, no, per no. like this is request a SOP? One fee so for, for those requests. Right. Well, so we had, we had a, a facility in our community that um, a lot of open permits and there was a lot of stuff to go through. So the entity needed to review all those files. Like this is the same correct. Thing that's again. the same one. Right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so they had one architect come over, review everything, but now there's someone else in need to see those documents. And that's a total of five boxes. So they will pay the company directly. They don't they are not worried about it. But one thing that we feel is fair uh, is that we're going to have to talk to this company, verify everything they're taking out, and then verify everything that is coming back. And it's perfectly legal to do this? I mean, if they make a FOIL request, we have to provide it. We can just say... Correct. So FOIL request is different. This was not a yeah. FOIL request. This was a request from that entity to work with us to close out all their permits. Yeah. Would it for, work on a FOIL request, too? I don't know if it would. Well, well no, for, for a FOIL request, if we had to send it out for copying the uh the requester it's either 25 percent or the actual cost of production so this would be the actual cost of production mm -hmm. it's what they're paying they'll be paying now uh on but we're asked for is the administrative fee to manage the process no I, and i i know that in the past there have been a lot of files placed because when they were scanned they were i mean i have used the files upstairs yeah. and found incredibly incorrect documents. I mean, you know, I just have to just give them back to staff saying this is in the wrong file. Right. So. But as Dan said, uh, of the cost of copying it, and it's legal to the charge. I, Bob is here to confirm what I'm saying, Bob. It's legal to charge for copies in scanning. Did, Caroline, did you do this in Vernon or did you do this in Tuckahoe at all? Vernon, yeah. yes. They did it in Mount Vernon. Mm -hmm. It's a board of counties. It's legal to charge actual cost, not staff time. Mm -hmm. We did actual cost of reproduction. 
Mm -hmm. So this is, so what you're charging for is a fee to inventory before and after to make sure everything's it's an back? inventory fee, yes. Making sure that when we receive that box back from this third party company, everything is there. I'm not sure that's- yeah, That doesn't operative. seem- Okay. If we need to charge a company, to, to that to the scan, they can have to take it. Correct, and they will pay this company back. directly. We won't be involved. But not, you can't charge a fee for your staff to review the documents before the documents. Yeah. I understand. Okay. So that, that means no. So we can't charge you know, five dollars of black fee to make sure that those files go out perfectly and come back. Well, are you charging that in addition to? They will pay this company directly, right? Are you charging that in addition to the cost of? Scanner. Correct. It will be in a different fee. A fee on the fee schedule. Okay. We can't charge that. Okay. So that was it. We have the answer. Thank you. All right. That's okay. Sorry. That's okay. Not only that. If it was exactly for that, but there was a fee for reproduction. Okay. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate the sentiment, though. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, small grants funding application process. Lani, oh, know? yes. Um, so this is something that came up to the board that we already agreed upon in terms of um, setting aside a certain amount of money for, um, for individuals who are... Uh, who have been flooded, who were, are not able to meet the the um the requirements of it, whether it's income or something it has to be income uh, or uh income based uh requirements by the state but since the state is also um going through their transitions of merging uh departments and people literally just and this was like supposed to be the aftermath of Ida, but now we have the aftermath of Ophelia and people literally are just recovering, still recovering from what ha has happened um, to their homes. Uh, I would like to start the process now of creating an application and uh, based upon, usually what people do is do it based upon income level, which we usually service low income, uh, low income individuals, but with all the damage that has been done to uh, people in this community, their income could say one thing, but their actual what they have in the bank is one is a different thing. Especially with the amount of money that they have been shelling out to repair their homes constantly, um, and I believe that we should be able to give them. Um, uh, we should be able to uh, put forth this application as a ASAP so that they can help. Uh, take care of their homes and their families. So um, I kind of went over this with Jerry um, and this is only for residential um, properties um, and the individuals living in those those <laughs> spaces. Um, so we the schedule or what I'm proposing is 20 grants at $10,000 each um, with the 100% AMI or below and 16 grants for 5,000 each. 30% AMI below. Any questions? No. Sounds like a good idea. What do you guys think? That, that would be our money. That is our, our money. It's already been set aside. Yeah, it's village money. money. It's our money to yes. do this. Okay, right. And and we can and this is and we're allowed to do this. Yeah. And how will be administered? Yeah, that's my the guidelines are very loose as far as uh, if there's no way to administer except first come, first serve based on their I mean, we're we're allowed to do it because it's it's something we can do with ARPA money. Mm -hmm. That's why, right? Yep. Because it's a, it's we well, don't usually give out grants to individuals. Yeah. So so you know because you've been tracking it, right? When we first started talking, Dan and I first started talking about ARPA money, it was very restricted. Mm -hmm. You can't do this. You can't do that. So many communities, many elected officials complained about that because of all the uh, handcuffing that the, the ARPA rules have. Have opened up significantly, mm -hmm. and and in this regard, um, you know, it's easier to be able to distribute money uh, for moderate and 
and low income individuals. Um, so it would be a first come first serve um, based on the number of applications that we get. That's really how we would distribute it. We'd have to make sure that they qualify for the AMI. Great. They'd have to disclose information to us. Would we be creating the application or that is there an application that's up that we could use? I think we'd have to create it. I don't think there's a standard application that could. No, 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 we would have to create. I mean, okay. has any? Do we know if anybody's tried this yet? I mean, it was it was on the list of things we could do. Yes, it was, and so the reason Leilani and I talked a little bit about this, first of all, because Leilani kept asking what's going on, what's going on with the state money, and the state because they merged the office of um, the governor's office of storm recovery and the uh, office of uh, um, resiliency home mm -hmm. home resiliency and communities. Um, they've kind of gone a different direction with that 41, $42 million that the state set aside, of which 30 million is supposed to come to Westchester. They've decided to designate, not necessarily through the RFP, but designate nonprofit 501 type entities to work with the state and the community to give out that money for rental assistance, rental reimbursement, as well as replacement of uh, some of their issues, some of the issues that were created by the flood. You know, a lot of the communities I've seen have basically used their ARPA money for capital. It's, it's again, low-hanging fruit, easy to do, allowed per the rules. So it's a, uh, it's, it's a- We have to limit, I mean, we have to be specific about what the improvements can be. Yeah. It, it, it seems Raising, a great I mean, idea. Uh, to get some of that money to actual to people. If a property owner spent $10,000 yeah. on re-sheet rocking and, and mm -hmm. studying their, their basement, it goes to that. So yeah. I think be retroactive, we can reimburse them for things that they've done. Yeah. Okay. And, and if they had to replace bedrooms, dressers, bureaus, furniture, that's also yeah. stuff. But we're just looking to help them out a little bit with, these are not large sums of money. I mean, no, 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 but really it's something. Large sum of money yeah, if you have not, to. And not to be, yeah, uh, not to be presumptive. So I imagine, you know, they would have to verify their costs. Like we verify, when we get grants, we have to provide these uh, grant providers with copies of receipts, invoices, cancel checks, or, then, you know, so they, they know that, uh, that we, we would know that it's actually been paid for. And, and when you say first come, first serve, that would be uh, the, uh, car, the, the date of the the loss, and not necessarily when you received a uh, an application, right? Or... No, it's when I received the application. So if I have twenty applications in five days, and twenty and application twenty one comes in on the sixth day, I've run out of money. So I have to kind of vet them while I'm doing it, and say at some point we could get 40, 50 applications, and once we reach twenty. I don't have anything. I have to go by the date that, that they were submitted. Uh, it seems like it could be a problem. Yeah, so it's a little, but I don't have any other way of doing it. You couldn't, you couldn't do it by, by uh, you know. The, I think the date of the law still will be exactly the same for many of these applications. It'll be the same exact date. Or maybe the same two dates. Same two dates, right? Yeah. So when can we expect the application to the applications to start going out? So so Dan and I can work on an application that that we can put in front of you to kind of maybe you know kick around a little bit at the next meeting mm -hmm. and then shortly after that we okay. make some tweaks if we forgot something. Right. But, uh, and then I think we have to really like announce the application so it's fair. Well, it's we not, have to. We have. I, we're talking about it now. We should keep talking about it. No, we have. This has is not something that it has not been talked about because we I put it forth towards the board and we, you know, it's but we can. Yes, if we're going to put it out, put it out through the newsletter and you can sit there and say state that we are working on the application process, hoping to have it done by the end of the year. And that please, it's it is on a first come first basis. So, yes, I guess I'm agreeing with what you're saying, but um. And, and maybe maybe uh, a specific date when the when the form goes up and is available, sure. so so that everybody has the same starting yeah. starting point. But but no, I think Nora's point is we keep talking about it mm -hmm. until that date is announced, mm -hmm. and then then you know, then, you know yeah. okay. then it starts then it's live. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. All right. I don't know whether it's. I mean, Bob, did you did you have something? You just looked. You sure. you look like you were going to say something. Yeah. So do we do? He, I don't think he, do. Could we, if it's too many, 
do we consider like a lottery? If it's, I mean, what if you get 41, what if, what if you get three more grants than you can have, then I'd you like can do the first day. and ask for a little bit more funding to make sure that we take care of everybody that's in need and not just people who are trying to grab, like if I put an application in, it should be rejected. So those kinds of things. Is this something we can- <laughs> We'll, we'll reject it. Right. right, yeah, but it should be rejected. I'm not that person in need. Is this something we can consistently budget for, though? Like, could we set that each fiscal year? We have a lot to give away money, yeah, right? That, I mean, so. Well, that, 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 I think that becomes an issue because um, right now it's allowed with the ARPA funds. We're using our own money to provide direct financial assistance to a third party. That mm -hmm. would be you, your gift of funds territory, I'd imagine. But that's a. But, but understand that there's a little bit of ARPA money that probably may not get spent mm -hmm. exactly the way we want. Um, so we're still working on it. Is this something that the county, like that we can work with the county that when our pot is done and they have the assistance program where they can go do this? We can approach the county, but I have no, I have no idea. Okay. Have no idea. <laughs> the county likes to distribute money, funds that they get from the state. Yeah. So we're distributing funds that we receive from another, in another level. We're well, distributing, so reviewing some of the resolutions already approved for the use of ARPA funds and if the board wants to revisit those funding decisions that's that's within your prerogative. So Leilani, Dan will have a draft form, draft application on November 13th if we promised that already. Thank you. Actually that does bring up a subject about our meeting so, schedule for November. Which... Okay. Uh <clears throat> Proposed local law leads suspension of state notice requirement. Thank you, Mayor. What is this? This is a technical change. Basically, it doesn't change anything. You may recall the board adopted a local law uh, which changed the notice requirement. Well, the mic is on. Yeah, mic's not on. The uniform notice requirements for all of the, uh, yeah, for all of the dangerous things. In doing so, one of the provisions at the bottom of the page was that the board superseded the village law by doing it, which is the board's right to do. That's a standard item we put in when we're superseding the law. Shortly after the law became effective, I got a question from council for the zoning board saying, hey, but what about the state law requirements? And I explained that there was a provision in the local law that superseded state law. What I realized then though, was that the supersession language would not be in the codified version because we put it in as a, as a different section in the local law. And as a result, a question could arise a year, two years, five years from now about which apply. So I thought it would be a good idea to amend the codified part to put the specific supersession language in the codified part in the code, so that in the future, there's no question that the notice requirements of state law had been superseded. And basically, what you did to supersede was you eliminated the publishing in the newspaper requirement. Right. Uh, and you're certainly, you're absolutely entitled to this video power to do that. And you did it. The question here is just putting that in the code so that no one raises the question, has to look back to the local law years later if they. Question arises as to whether you superseded or not. Okay, so it's just belt oh, and suspenders, more or less, right? Correct. Right. Yeah. It just, just protects it in the future from your know, questioning, unnecessary questions in the future. Anybody have any questions, concerns? No. Uh, do you want to put this on the agenda for November 13th to schedule a public hearing? That's fine. Yep. Yeah. You asking me? No, I'm asking him. <laughs> yes. 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 We know Bob does. <laughs> uh, change order three three A. Start with that. Can we pass down a microphone, please? Move the mic for the engineer. So the Mount Pleasant Avenue sidewalk and drainage improvement projects uh, along Ralph and Gertrude Avenue completed. 
the contractor, unfortunately, due to a couple of uh, unforeseen subsequent conditions, different conditions, and due to the compressed time schedule, uh, the work needed to be done prior to uh, our getting to school and our Labor Day, uh, incurred additional charges. Um, and in addition, some of the subsurface conditions, uh, we had to pull for addition, excava additional excavation work. Um, so, so we were asking for the uh, change order, and we're now at approximately ninety-four thousand um, dollars. Again, about thirty-three thousand of those dollars are due to the compressed time schedule, uh, and the majority of it was from uh, different conditions that we had to, you know, when we were excavating for the small water improvements. Uh, in addition to that, uh, yeah, the, the extra, extra quantities are here too. So yeah, the, the yeah the change order request incorporates uh, the items that you mentioned, the additional work. Plus, there were also exceedance of certain mm -hmm. bid unit items uh, during the course of, of the project. I think uh, that was around one hundred and so one hundred eighty five thousand, which all on the drainage side because that was the more complex and uh, you know once you once you put a shovel in the ground. Unfortunately, you 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 find more than you anticipate. Uh, seems to be a universal content you know, concept with a lot of projects. This is a huge project. Uh, we are seeking reimbursement for the uh, stormwater portion of this project through FEMA. Uh, I've already had uh, public sessions of the public engineer and working on segregating those costs, uh, and then we are also seeking reimbursement through the county. Uh, for the CDBG portion of the time of work. Yep, it's uh, $275,000 from Westchester County that, that we will be uh, seeking reimbursement for. But basically the money's been spent. Yes, yeah. Yeah, field changes, right? Field, field, yeah, field changes, yeah. right. I mean, the, the project was all- the project was. And so how come they didn't come to us to the change order while it was going on? Because of the compressed time schedule, or we had to get this job completed before the mayor gets to the uh, it, it was not uh, that it was, it, it, we encountered a lot of uh, poor soils. I mean, they, knew it, they knew it was compressed, but they uh, but there were field conditions that made it right. more complicated. Right. Yeah, I mean, that, that was our overarching goal. Yeah. Well, and to make sure that this project got finished by the time school opened and it literally got finished, I think the day before the day school before. opened. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and again, I mean, I, when I was out in the field, I guess when we were starting to excavate the area where we did experience you know, the subsidence of the previous culverts, we found out why. There, there was a lot of soil under, under, under the pipes that really had to get removed. So there was a lot of those quantities that they were overdue for additional excavation additional backing material that we put back. We encountered um, the actual old uh, dry stack stone headwall that used to be the old headwall to the creek that was actually at Alf and Elliott Avenue that now is located way down between uh, two residential structures. Uh, so we looked at a lot of you know, just the different conditions. No, and in some cases, and I'm I, I'm trying to find it now, they had, there were, there was like, there were changes requested by homeowners. Uh, yeah, no, due to the, 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 a lot of the change orders were due to, uh, uh, some of the sidewalk project mm -hmm. on Mount Pleasant Avenue. Mm -hmm. Uh, the sidewalks, uh, when they, when they were, uh, installed, they really quite didn't match up properly with a lot of the driveways, mm -hmm. causing a lot of cars, mm -hmm. residents to be bottomed out. So yeah. we had to actually go into Bless some you. of the driveways to kind of make the transition a little smoother. Another change order was to, uh, uh, replace four concrete slabs that uh, with bluestone slabs so we can maintain the bluestone sidewalk all along that Mount Pleasant Avenue. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that was another one. Uh, so, so, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, Ford, but um, I know how to handle the change order and the additional money with the FEMA project because we, we talk weekly and they want. We used to we used to meet every other week. Now we meet every week to try to close out these projects. But um, and if we have orders on CPPG, who handles that first? The county with the state or well I mean there's there, 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 there's not really a change order issue with the county because we're we're maxed out at the amount of money that we're going to get from Westchester County. 
So, so the change order, they don't pay to the other half. Yeah, I mean, I, I was uh, I'm waiting actually for uh, the second payment to be authorized before I submit to Westchester County because the first requisition was actually slightly less than what we needed to hit that 275. Yeah. It's like 540,000. Yeah, and I want it to be 550. I need to spend 550,000 first. The um, sidewalk issues, do the homeowners participate in, is there any fees involved in that at all? Uh, where the sidewalks had to be, uh, yeah. the drivers had to be readjusted? No. 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 Because, no. It, all right. I, mean, I, I remember, it, you know, when, when I had, when I would complain about a sidewalk in a neighboring community, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. that they would uh, fix it and then I'd, I'd get a bill for part of the, uh, the repair. That, that's, yeah, that's yeah a, we, we used to have a 50-50 program in the village, but that hasn't been funded for, for many years. Um, you know, according to New York state law, um, the homeowner is responsible for maintenance of a sidewalk. Mm -hmm. Uh, on in front of their property, but like if we're replacing the entire sidewalk, then then we do it. Uh, so it's it's uh, that I think that's uh, where it came in with uh, your maybe your prior experience. Yeah, and, and I'm I'm concerned about the okay the, the new sidewalk doesn't match the old driveway. Is that really on us to to fix? Uh, I guess uh, it, the way one, one yes in a way. It was kind of you know the the elevations really weren't working out properly. Uh, we made some uh, some additional changes, I guess, in that area. We got rid of the grass strip. Yeah. Also, that kind of made everything look a little bit more uniform. So, I think there was a total of three driveways. One was the most severe. The other two was a little bit more uh, not as severe. But yeah, this is something that yeah. the entire project. Yeah, we kind of created the condition yeah. by doing the by project. Doing the okay. Ideally, the goal is to have. Or repaired sidewalks by their, by their homeowners, so that wheelchair for someone with a walker. Oh, we still got a second section to do, so let's uh, move on a little bit. Uh, 3B awarding contract village sidewalk improvements. Yeah, yeah, we had the bid opening last Thursday. I, we'd spoke, I spoke with the board at the last work session. Uh, the bids came in. The low bid was received from uh, Peter J. Landy Incorporated. I think it was for about $865,000 and change. Uh, Landy has done work in the village in the past. They did the last CDBG project, which was the new sidewalk on Waverly and uh, uh, East Prospect Avenue. They also constructed the uh, pedestrian safety improvements at uh, Fenimore and Prospect. Uh, they were you know, significantly lower than the uh, second low bid. It was uh, within the engineer's estimate, well, which is part of the agenda tonight. Uh, uh, and uh, we are asking for, you know, in order to avoid uh, asking for a change order, we're asking for uh, a 15% contingency uh, in the project uh, to increase the total appropriation to $1 million. Uh, like I said, you never know what type of field changes uh, you're going to run into. Um, I suspect not going to be as dramatic as what we experienced with the drainage project, but you know, it uh, we do want to just protect ourselves in case uh, in case that happens. And Landy did the um, the uh, river dredging in, 20, in 2011, also. Yeah, uh, yeah. He, yes, he did. Let's see that. All right. The, the part of this money, um, four hundred thousand, comes from the uh, American Rescue Plan Act money, Marpa, and then one hundred seventy-five thousand change is the neighborhood stabilization. There's a significant kick in with money that um, we don't have to um, figure out how to uh, take it. So, the, so the fiscal impact is a million, but it's a, a chunk of it is grant money. Yeah, more than 50%. Right? And he's pretty high or on the 15, but uh, in something like this, um, we're hoping that, and there's not major activation. So when you do major excavation, you got all sorts of crazy things that goes on. With sidewalks, a little bit different. Yeah, the fifteen percent contingency was something that we experienced early on, just the route number three Avenue. So we're kind of and I had asked for the fifteen percent, but uh, again, I guess that's most of those uh, 
chain orders and, and additional costs were due to the uh, the uh, major excavation work. Almost one hundred twenty-five thousand in that. Okay, everybody found that. Yeah. Yes. All right. Uh, the next up is a professional service agreement to provide construction inspection services for contract. Well, this, this is for uh, hiring somebody to oversee this work. This is for a uh, uh, session that we have on there that has the ASCJ to perform the construction inspection for this sign work work. Uh, entry uh, is to have this completed uh, on or about December 15th. Uh, so we are again working on a very uh, aggressive it's schedule. Uh, or hope a municipal contract is going to start uh, probably on or around November 1st. Uh, yeah, thank you. And then this would be the construction inspection for these for all the signs. Thank you. Um, transfer of funds for Harbor Island Park associated with Block Park. So, Mayor, we had uh, paved the uh, one third portion of the Harbor Island Park near the uh, dog park. And uh, uh, had a conversation uh, with Laura. We have approximately uh, $13,000 in that fund. Uh, Morano's bill came in at just over $24,000. Uh, speaking with Jeff, Jeff uh, was asking us to leave just a small portion of money in there. So we're requesting uh, an additional uh, 14500 to fund and pay for the, uh, the additional funds for Morano to that paid the lot. They paid the lot. It's not a park park per se. This is just a, a, a fortune. Funny, it was the first, the, the last third of that yeah. park around parking lot closest to the park park. So the long, narrow one behind the sewage treatment plant? Correct. Which we're proposing to do with previous surface, right? Right. That's so um, I can explain if you like. Uh, that we are also proposing to do with uh, previous asphalt, but just the remaining portion of it. Uh, we will see if we can if through natural topography, slope the existing paved area, the new paved area towards it. But if not, we could certainly do some drainage improvements in that area to slope everything towards the new pervious asphalt of the drains. To catch that water on these pervious and sure. add it to the pervious. Right. But, but this really isn't the part, the, 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 part, the, part, the no. dog park. This no. is just park. But it needed to be done to, to be done. in order to make the yeah. park usable. Because um, uh, the people who park there were also people who, you know, were, a lot of soccer park. A lot of soccer park. Yeah, yeah. A lot of times you can't get park there because it's, it's so. Uh, all right. It's so it's just really Harbor Island Park, the last bit of Harbor. Yeah. All right. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think that that's it. That, that is right. it for tonight's agenda. Uh, first, I need a motion to close the work session. Uh, I need a motion to close the work session. So moved. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Now I need a motion to go into executive session. Uh, we have two items on the executive session. Uh, Pre-committee is anticipated that a motion will be offered to enter into executive session pursuant to 105.1 F of the New York State Public Offices Law to discuss, uh, it, it's the point of the decree committee. Uh, and the other is a litigation, United States uh, versus Westchester Joint Waterworks, Town of Paris and Village of Mimari. In the town of Amarnik. Uh item that, that would be under 105.1b. Uh, I will make those motions. Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, we go into the side room for this. Can you use a little voice from you? I'll beat you there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was so hot. We had some success. So, 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 so,
I think so. since he changed his hours to nine to five, he's have a problem. He's the work six p.m. to six a.m. From LMC. You got, there's some pizza or whatever else you're looking for. Whatever did you order? Did you order? No. Oh. We got pizza. We got pie. Okay. 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 Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Which I put my own on. <laughs> this is like, guys have been looking for No, it's it's not. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. oh, yeah. They just removed that panel. Oh, they, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I thought you could Uh, Board of Trustees meeting for uh, October 23rd. Before we begin, uh, I'd like to make a motion to end our executive session. So, Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Now, please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. Aye. Aye. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, there are uh, exits on this. There are emergency exits on my right where the police officer is, and on my left uh, where Mr. Cutler is. Uh, please turn off the uh, sound on your phone, mute your phone, or any other device that you have. Uh, I need a motion to open the regular meeting. Second. All in favor? Uh -huh. Aye. Thank you. Uh, Open meeting, presentations. There were no presentations tonight. Report from the village manager. Thank you, Mayor. So I wrote this earlier and provided it to the board of trustees. Um, so tonight I'll discuss the next steps that we'll be taking um, uh, involving the Army Corps project, but I do need to share one item that is more disturbing as far as um, things that are going on in the town of Mariner when it comes to our poor and economically challenged residents. Residents that we share with the town, they're both village residents and town residents, 
in the past year or so have been forced to make changes based on significant adjustments to the former town housing voucher program, their community services that they provide, as well as, in my opinion, the overall route, outreach to our village residents who are in need. As everyone knows, the town has sent, well, let's put it that way. I assume everyone knows that the town sent the housing voucher program to the state of New York after we expressed interest in managing it. Now, housing program participants, the poor in our community, which the town and the and Marchmont do not have, must deal with state offices and not a local office any longer. Additionally, according to the village code, the town was designated for over 15 years to work with developers to market and place people who need affordable housing units. That ceased when the Department of Community Services was disbanded and their employees laid off. The office is now focused on transportation and seniors, not the poor of our community. I guess poor people don't vote because everyone knows seniors do. Furthermore, the town has abolished illegally, in my opinion, the Board of Control. Firsthand, I know firsthand that the reason town administration did not think that there was any value in LMC Media Services due to cutting the cord uh, with cable TV. However, while many of us have cut the cord and we understand I believe most of our senior residents have not, and in the future, I believe they will not have the ability to view town and village meetings once those channels go away. Cable TV stations for municipal events and meetings hopefully will be preserved in the village for as long as it can, and I hope that the Board of Trustees backs up that service for our seniors. As an aside, I also believe that future village of Maranac residents will be unable to view town meetings because when we have separate franchise agreements, you will not be able to see a town meeting if you live in the village and you will not be able to see a village meeting if you live in the town. That's too bad. Obviously, I'm upset about the town cutting services to our poor and our seniors since I know they have very few poor in their community. That impact that impacts us the most because we're in need. And from what I know, there are not many poor, which I say it again, in the town of Mamarana or village of Larchmont. On Friday, after talking to the Waverly Avenue Bridge contractor, I learned that the town did not, NOT, fund police detail for traffic control for residents driving from Mamarana Avenue School or the train station or driving from the town to the village. I know. And Mr. Sonoff and Chief DeRuta will confirm that traffic control aspects for this bridge project and included in the traffic control plan, plan were included in every meeting as well as in the plan. Since Friday, we are actively working on a plan to remedy that oversight based on the emails between the mayor and the town supervisor. And I want to thank the mayor for being very strong in his position, and I appreciate that very much. In the meantime, until the town of Mamaroneck funds the police traffic control, we will not have officers at the intersection. If it goes on too long, I will not have any choice. I will not. I will have no choice but to rescind the contract with road opening permit, uh, which I discussed with the village attorney earlier today. Now for some better news. I'm happy to report that because of the pressure applied by Mayor Murphy and trusting guys are read, we had a very successful Army Corps meeting, which included the state DEC and the County of Westchester on Friday. Also, very impactful at the meeting, I want to thank the representatives from Senator Gillibrand and Senator Schumer's office and their insistence of getting the Army Corps to move ASAP with a new estimate for the project and to start that work. We are going from an $88 million project to somewhere around $125 million deep in friction. I want to explain the successes at that meeting. While the design is complete for the removal of the Ward Avenue Bridge, we, the village, decided to work with the county for funding to remove the bridge under our oversight. Additionally, I have been directed to remove the Center Avenue pedestrian bridge as soon as possible to clear that floodway impediment. During this time, 
we will work with the existing Army Corps of Engineer permits and the permits we already have in hand and our existing approvals for continued dredging. One aspect that I think we should consider as a no-brainer is the continued formation of a new work group that has been created to elevate homes in the flood zone. Dan and I met with a small group on Friday, are actively seeking applicants so that they can utilize grant money, RIC and state risk money, and other resources. Our first meeting on Friday, we decided to include the CRC in our discussions because I learned that they have applied to be a 501 agency to distribute state funds on the Office of Home Resiliency and Community. Another item that has us moving forward is the corresponding request for the Thruway Authority and what is required to fix the issues of overflow flooding. Um, that letter will be signed by the mayor uh, once Dan finishes it up tomorrow. But really it's a letter that, that uh, the Committee for the Environment has asked the mayor and, uh, and us to, to, to send over. We are hiring a consultant SLR to work directly with myself and Gino on the proof that the throughway needs to demonstrate that their flooding or their impervious surface impacts flooding in our community, as well as to finally come up with a plan for the Mamaroneck Reservoir. Earlier today, maybe 10 o'clock, Gino and I spoke with the state DEC dam safety bosses. Uh, we learned that uh, in the past, they have approved variances for dams. However, what I believe is a game changer is that this year and next year, dam safety has been included in a grant funding program by the state for $50,000 for studies and $5 million per construction project. Uh, we will have a full report and memo on our meeting earlier today on November 13th which will include the removal and rebuilding of the dam as an option. Now, since we would qualify for the $5 million funding, funding will not be an impediment for improving the dam situation. Last, at the request of the mayor, I have registered to attend all county legislature, legislator meetings, as well as any budget meetings that are held. I do wanna thank county planning and operations who both attended our Army Forum meeting on Friday. <laughs> and are ready to share funds that they have set aside to start the ACE project on a reimbursement basis. And I'll manage that process with Dan, Gino, um, and the typical excellent staff at the village. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, invitation to address the board. Uh, limiting comment three minutes as usual. Anybody want to address the board? Our old friend Glenn. No, it doesn't start until I hit the phone. I, yep. <laughs> it's good to see you back, Glenn. Thank you. Ron Tippett, 506 Hill Street, member of the Budget Committee, but speaking here at Gordon Mass North Hill Street. <laughs> uh, a couple of things, uh, a couple of things that uh, Jerry went over. Understand, some of the things that are going on is uh, done by the town of Monarne. 60% of village members are members of the town of Mamarnik. And we can go to the town of Mamarnik board and express our displeasure at what they're doing to the village. They're basically, as the old saying used to be, they're, they're treating us like the stepchild. Red-headed stepchild. The red-headed stepchild. <laughs> and, and it's not right because they charge us for the services. You see what your town ta taxes are. And as they're not afraid to, to, to put that charge on the village of Mamarnik residents. So as we fill this room, occasionally you got to fill the room over there or they just don't get it or they, or they don't pay attention. Uh, during the work session, you uh, did go over a, a, a very, uh, uh, let's, let's say uh, lofty, plan for uh, rec and uh, parks and such. And it's all well and good, but understand something, okay? 
as 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 rosy as Jeff and Jace and the jury might say it, revenues aren't going to come close to covering these costs. But you, if you really want the programs, just you know, you're going to have to tell the village we we might be looking at a one or one and a half percent increase in your property tax, but we feel these are the programs you want. That that would be the honest answer. When you talk about two hundred two and a half million dollars for a water park, and it's a 20, 20 year, probably a twenty year bond, the bond in interest isn't even covered by every penny brought in by the beach currently. There, there's just there's just no way. You also are going to have additional cost of what what is the uh, additional cost of maintenance and what is the additional cost of personnel. Again, it's all fine and good, but, but just be honest with the taxpayers. We think these programs are essential for our community. We think they're essential for teens. We think they're essential for children, seniors. We think it's a great way to spend money. And we, we, we may be raising taxes a little bit, but we are greatly enhancing services. And that's what I would consider being honest with the village and getting the programs through that will enhance our village. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tiffany. Thank you. Welcome home. Thank you. Okay, hey, anybody else? We had a few comments on the public hearing. Yeah, well, when when we get to the public hearing part. Yeah. That'll be that'll be coming up soon. Stuart Teacher. Um I have a bunch of Pretty much yes, no questions that I think are, should be of general interest to those residents. Um, I'm going to go through them. And if you choose to answer them, that's great. If you don't, I'm going to assume that that's a no. Do we currently have a floodplain manager as is required by law? In 2021, the board approved $15,000 to design and do cost estimates for a sidewalk along the old Boston Post Road. Has that been done? <laughs> two, over two years ago, the village board approved, I believe, about $80,000 for Municipality 5 to be implemented in the building department. Has that been implemented yet? The dredging contractor started working a month, six weeks ago. Is he continuing to work? I've been around to the rivers. I haven't seen any activity? The Army Corps plan envisions the Army Corps needing 85 properties, a section of 85 properties um, to do their work. Within the talks with the Army Corps, was there any discussion of whose responsibility it will be to bear the cost of gaining the easements they need? And the last one is, a lot of people have been talking about garbage on the street on the MSC2. Is there a requirement in village code that the village pick up commercial garbage? I see there's one for residential garbage, but I couldn't find anything that required the village to pick up commercial garbage. As I said, I think they're all reasonable questions that affect pretty much everybody in the village. I'm sorry, nobody could enlighten me. Do we? I mean, do we have answers to any of those questions? Do you want to answer? No, I'm saying, do we? I would like to know if the if we, the staff has answers to any of those questions. Those are well. You, I you, mean, you can answer them, Nora. If you'd like, you could answer them. Uh, but you know, anything you say can and will be used 
in a court of law. <laughs> I just have a quick question, Mr. Teeker. Um, yeah. What was the last state, last one you mentioned? Commercial garbage. Thank you. Whether the village is required by code to pick up commercial garbage. Because Thank I you. I believe sir. it's a fairly, my understanding is we pick it up seven days a week, which is a considerable expense. Thank you. Do you have a question? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, 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 I'm, I'm interested to know what the answer to those questions are, is what the answers to those questions are too. Okay. <laughs> Why don't you ask staff tomorrow and you can share it with uh, Mr. Ticker. Okay, anybody else? All right, let's go on to the public hearings. Public hearing on PLLW. 2023 stormwater management item 2a on the agenda first off i need a motion to open this public hearing so moved second all in favor aye, aye. all right uh what this is doing uh, you know, mr cutler we have you here why don't you why don't you give us a presentation the storm design from a 25 year to 100 year storm in all circumstances, um, instead of just referencing to the New York State Stormwater Design Manual. Um, it also creates a retrofit requirement for substantial projects. Um, there's also a stormwater zoning intervention. Uh, so this is a zoning code change adding an impervious lot coverage requirement where one does not exist at all at the moment. Um, and then there's some resiliency focused zoning interventions. Uh, these are really meant to incentivize the elevating of homes and the construction of new construction that is resilient to floods um, in accordance with FEMA standards, um, making sure that when you're elevating a building, that the lowest floor can be flooded, that the floodwater can proceed, and that the building is okay. Um, so it's measuring height from to get about base flood elevation, exempting floor area below that's in the flood in the flood zone, uh, exempting stories below, and allowing for projections into the front yard for building access. And actually, this is something that Mr. Tippett has been mentioning for years. It's it's good practice, yeah. really. Um, and the last one is improving infill housing provisions. Um, mm -hmm. This is creating a point based system for green infrastructure. Uh, which will have additional benefits, but the, the main focus of this was was really pushing for uh, increased stormwater uh, retention or detention on on lots that are redeveloped for uh, infill housing and commercial zone. So, and we go through. I'll just go through each one of them and just kind of outline what we're doing. Um, the twenty-five to one hundred year. <laughs> this will apply to any any project involving two hundred square feet of disturbance. Um, the retrofit requirement, I, I think, is, is really important because um, looking at the when housing was built in the community, the majority of it was built, 85% of it was built before 1980 and likely has no stormwater uh, systems at all. Um, and most of the water, at least of the impervious surfaces, is just sheet flowing onto the village streets and going into village storm drains at a high rate, which leads to uh, contributions to the river. Um, you know, the village is not the only, you know, contributor to the river. I mean, it's a, it's a very large watershed, as we know, it goes all the way up to White Plains uh, Airport. Um, but we can do what we can here. And 
I just want to make sure I didn't miss anything in the last one. Uh, yeah, good. Um, stormwater zoning interventions. Uh, this is a maximum impervious lot coverage requirement. Uh, it's 15% for residential districts. I gave an example uh, for a 5,000 square foot lot in an R5 zone, which is, uh, I think, probably the most common single family building lot that we have. Um, and essentially, you the current requirements for building coverage is 35%. Um, and then there would be 15% on top of that for impervious coverage. Uh, so that's about 700, well, it's not about, it's exactly 750 square feet, um, which is pretty much a 12 by 12 patio and a 60 by 10 driveway. Uh, comes out to a little under 750 square feet. Um, if somebody wanted to have a larger patio, they could, they could do something with a pervious uh, material as long as it's compliant with the definition uh, that it doesn't meet the definition of improvements. Um, and then a 10% requirement in certain non-residential districts, which is which is stricter. And we would expect that in those circumstances, they would have to use more permeable surfaces if they um, are trying to uh, go over the allotment. Um, the resiliency, uh, I, I already explained these in the, in the beginning. Go to the next slide. And uh, this kind of just shows what that means. A uh, bit of a rudimentary image, but uh, it gets the point across. Um, if a house is currently at 35 feet, and you, okay, go no, go ahead, no, go through. Um, then then, it, then uh, to elevate the house, they would require variances. And, and we do see these variances coming before. The zoning board. Um, there's been at least two in the past few months, um, and I'm sure there have been more uh, prior. To that. Um, interesting to know uh, or concerned about, you know, having two tall buildings. Um, there was a, a, a analysis that I did in 2016, um, oh, yeah. for which the data hasn't changed. Uh, that demonstrated that 71 percent of the sample properties. Not, I didn't check every property in the village. Seventy-one percent of the properties um, would have see a height increase of under five feet. So just to, five feet. So <laughs> to simplify it, so if if I live in an area where the the uh, flood is six feet, right? I can and I'm allowed to have a thirty-five foot house. Yeah. I can then start counting at thirty-five at eight. So it, it would actually be at the end of the day, 43 feet. Okay. Just so, so people could get the math and the idea in the head. Right. And if, and if someone is in an area where they know that their flooding impacts have been higher than two feet above base flood elevation, right. Um, this would still provide them with, with more relief uh, because you, you don't have to go to the height limit um, and it would get them, you know, it would give them the ability to still have, a little more space than if the current zoning is in, in place. So, you know, if you want to go four feet above base flood elevation, um, you'll still be allowed and you'll, you'll still be able to have a little bit more space to do that. Um, why don't we go on to the next one? Uh, this is too small for me to read from where I am, but I have memorized a good amount of it. So I to um, it's improving infill housing. Uh, this is a green infrastructure matrix, a point-based system for residence uses in commercial districts. Currently, there is a, a requirement that developments have green infrastructure and green building elements to the satisfaction of the planning board as part of their special permit. Uh, this gives the planning board more authority um, while also giving applicants the, the, uh, the ability to kind of choose what fits the site. Um, although it's it's either you're choosing all of the ones on uh, underneath the first one to reach 100 points, um, or you're choosing the first one and a couple of the other ones. Uh, the first one being a 500 year storm design. Um, so that's right out in center. It's really designed to steer folks in that direction, but where it's not possible, you can do all of these other things, which include uh, having uh, permeable pavers and porous, porous concrete uh, that's not counted towards your stormwater uh, compliance. So that would be in excess of the 100 year storm should this be adopted. Uh, it includes uh, solar panels with a minimum, bike parking with a minimum, 
exceeding uh, state energy code, uh, biophilic design elements, which I'll get to on the next slide. Um, hopefully I remember everything. 100% uh, electrical systems for heating. And uh, I think that's everything. Blue roof. Blue roof. I think we included that with the biophilic design. Yeah. 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 That's the last one. And then just to give a definition, because I know it sounds like a bit of a jargony word. Uh, biophilic design elements are, are elements that incorporate natural systems into building design and building systems. Um, but biophilic design elements include biomimicry, habitat creation, and the creation of natural, natural landscapes. Examples include green walls, green roofs, and pollinate, pollinator sanctuary. And that's it. Okay. Good job. Thanks, Rick. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I, I think that this is a, a large step forward. And we can use this, if we pass this law, we can use this as an exemplar to the com communities north of us who are contributing so much storm water to us. But I think you, you have to get your own house in order before you tell other people get the house in order. Yeah. Anybody wish to comment? Nicole? Can we just make sure that that goes on the website? That's because that was really great. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Um, I agree. We need to get our house in order. Um, I think anybody who knows me knows that one of my focuses for the last decade has been strong water. And in my opinion, how poorly the village administers Chapter 294. Um, but to be clear, I am totally in favor of the allowing folks to raise their homes. Um, I am concerned that the base flood elevation was, I think, blown out of the water during Ida. Mm -hmm. So that that may not get people's first floor above another Ida. So I'm not sure how you deal with that in a law, but you might want to consider that. The stormwater stuff. And I just take a moment to say hi to Augie. It's nice to see him even on the screen. Um, I believe the rest, the going to a hundred year rain event as the criteria is, as the phrase goes, putting lipstick on a pig. Stormwater management is not flood mitigation. Light dredging, well, it means by incremental effects, it will never be meaningful. This law, if passed, will simply be burden signaling, signaling, like our leaf blower law, idling law, and stormwater law, that have never been meaningfully enforced. The result of increasing requirements for the 100 year storm event will only mean that developers and engineers will have to misrepresent their plans even more to gain approval from the village consulting engineer and the planning board. Instead of this law, why not focus on getting our building department and consultants to take stormwater management seriously and enforce our current law? Here's why I believe the administration of our current law is broken. Chapter 294, says that the building department may have the following inspections of stormwater at the start of construction, at the installation of sediment and erosion control measures, at completion of site clearing, at completion of rough grading, at completion of final grading, close to the construction season, completion of final landscaping and six, at the successful establishment of landscaping in public areas. The code also requires that all applicants must submit as-built plans for any stormwater management practice located on the site after final construction is completed. I know of no 
stormwater management plan in the village in the last 10 years where this has ever been done. A few examples. All of those inspections I just read, project was recently approved at 1310 Flagler Drive. On the building permit, there's not one required inspection of stormwater practices. There's no requirement to submit the as-built plans. <laughs> the 800 Rushmore site, which has been, uh, let me just say, on 1310 Flagler, it was approved without a floodplain development permit and without the necessary components to make it floodplain compliant. Same happened with Rushmore Avenue, 800. Um, the, build, the building department has not been able to produce a SWIP, which is the Stormwater Pollution Protection Plan, which is the basis of stormwater management. And they haven't been able to produce any review by the village consulting engineer. In six months, I originally asked for them in February of this year. I don't believe they exist. I believe this project was approved again in the floodplain without any stormwater management. 207 Grand Street, the longest running land use disaster in the village, 10 years now since it entered the uh, land use. System. <laughs> Building inspector went out, filed a report, said the Coltex were to plan. Seven months ago, I asked for the plan the Coltex were installed to. I've yet to get an answer. Mr. Teagut, may, may I ask that you just refer to your comments to the, the law in front of us? You're, you're rehashing I, the history I, of your... I, I'd appreciate I, it. I, I, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just I'm making a comment okay. that's, that's pertinent to what Thank you're you. saying. Have, Please let me finish. I'm just asking that you make the comments to the law that we have, not recite the history of your foil life. Please just keep it to the law we have. Mayor, my point I'm, I'm, is... I, I can't make you do it. I'm just okay. asking. I would appreciate not being hectored. You're not being hectored. Yes, it, it I am. It was a point hectored. of order, sir. It I'm was a sorry. point of order. It was a point of order, but go ahead. Okay. I, I believe my point was, and maybe you didn't hear it, was that increasing it to a hundred year um, requirement for properties over, with over 200 feet of soil disturbance is onerous. And it will never be enforced, even now. None of, very little of Chapter 294 is enforced. So I'll go on. So on 207 Grand, building inspector put it in an inspection report, saying the Coltex were to plan. When asked for the plan, they were submitted, they were installed to. The building department cannot produce them. 886 Orienta, everyone's favorite scoff law. The owners have been using their tool for two years, despite under information belief, it's lacking required safety components and has never completed their process of getting a certificate of compliance. There are, when the planning board approved this, they clearly had doubts about it. And they required eight things um, that had to be done before the board got, before the owners got compliance. Again, these were asked for six months ago, I was informed at that time that none of them had been completed. Again, these are requirements of the planning process for stormwater. If we have a system 
where the building department ignores the requirements of planning board review of stormwater, I'm not sure what the purpose of making our stormwater law even more restrictive. So I would suggest that instead of creating yet another environmental law that the village clearly won't enforce because they're not enforcing it now, that you focus on, and the village engineer's here tonight. So I'm assuming he understands stormwater. And I hope he will speak with the building inspector and try and come up with a system that actually sees that stormwater management plans that are put into effect are instituted at the sites. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Here we go, Grant Harris. So, what was in front of us was a stormwater management plan. That was the title of it. What I saw was one item discussing stormwater, 15 others discussing solar panels, bike parking, and other miscellaneous items, electrification, things that do not deal with stormwater. Additionally, this put every single item onto the property owner. Not a single item was what the village was going to do or any other steps that they will be taking to manage the storm water. I don't know if you want to pay attention or not. I'm hearing, I'm writing down notes. Um, additionally, on top of that, you're putting the onus on the owners. Every single project that is over 200 square feet is literally any project that anybody will ever have to do on their property, right? So now if they deserve 200 square feet, they have to then retain 500, you know, 500 stormwater flood water. That's not correct. Then explain That's not correct. Clearly. What, what you were looking at was the, the recommendations for, uh, for properties that need a special use permit. Special use permit is in, special use permits in a C1 and C2 district for infill housing. That would not affect a person doing a house. It was only for infill housing. The, you, yeah. So the examples were patios, driveways, a 500,000 yes. square foot lot, those are- Ms. Ms. Could you, could, could you- So, this, so this, is, this is not for residents, this is for- Special use permits, is that correct? The, the change from 25 to 100 year, would be for for every for everybody everybody um, no, you would talk about please please, please, please please let him finish okay. um but you you currently have to do a stormwater system at 200 square feet now it's just the changes from 25 to 100 which is not uh quadrupling it's actually depending on the safe circumstance you might have to put an extra coal tech like another chamber on the ground it's not like a, yeah no, right it's not like funny. so yeah. i am an engineer i do understand that the 500 year flood is is not five times on your foot, right? The elevation is sometimes as much as just like a foot more. That's, that's my point. The point is that anybody that deserves 200 square feet of their lot now has to put in huge retention tanks just because they want to put in a patio. But the village itself is not undertaking any steps to retain said water or to manage the water. You spent $2.7 million digging dirt out of the river. Right? What kind of time? Yeah. No, I'm just, okay. please go ahead. So instead of discussing during the stormwater management plan, solar panels and electrification buildings of individual residents, we should be discussing how okay. we are, well, hold on, excuse me, how we are managing the water and how it gets to the streams and out to natural sources of bodies of water. Right now you just did Ralph Bab or Gertrude Ave. You have two large 16 foot or 36 inch pipes going into a 16 inch pipe. It doesn't take an engineer to understand that just because you put in two large pipes, it's not going to get the water through that one small pipe that's going down Miranda Avenue. You need a plan that gets all of the storm water from the dam all the way out to 
the sound. That is a stormwater management plan. Nothing more, nothing less. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? <laughs> Glenn keeps getting up and getting beat. Bernie from Florida, FMAC, speaking for myself. Um, it's a step in the right direction. Um, is it perfect? I don't think it's perfect. And I'd like to make it perfect. Um, we need roof, mandatory roof retention systems or roofs. Um, to put this at the bottom of the list with rainwater retention and reusable systems or roofs is a, you know, the service to what this whole idea was about. Um, this, this idea came from the FMAC to not to hurt homeowners and not to hurt people that are, you know, want to improve their houses. This was a this was an insurance policy for the people who live in the flood zone. So any commercial or any multifamily that was in the flood zone, so just to put it at, at layman's terms, so everyone understands it because it gets confusion confusing, put it in layman's terms. We wanted to have 500 year flood storm, 500 storm flood management in the flood zone and mandatory roofs, detention roofs. Because in the flood zone, we have an aquifer. And whatever goes in the, in the ground gets inundated, period. Flood water comes up, and then it's done. There's no more storm water that works. And it was a hundred year for a multifamily or commercial that wasn't in the in the flood zone, but maybe drained into the flood zone with mandatory roof detention systems, not anything. Because it's all about timing here. The water comes down hard, it goes into the rivers fast. And the rivers inundate and the water gets uh, backs up. Okay. Just imagine, just imagine the Avalon, 131 Sheldrake Place, Phillips Park, House of Honda, Grant Street Lofts, the Marin Excel Storage. The, the, the new proposed addition for the self storage is 416 on Waverly, which they want to propose. 572 Van Rants, which is another uh, multifamily. 133 and 129 across the street, Prospect. 637 Barry, the Mason, and maybe soon to be the Hunter Lot. If they all had mandatory roof detention systems, okay, how many? Thousands of thousands of gallons of water would not go in and rush into the storm drains and inundate the rivers because it's all about timing. The floods come up fast and they recede fast. So it's a great step for forward. It's a great step forward, but it needs to be tweaked. And that roof retention system has to be mandatory. It has to be in there. We have an aquifer, especially in the flood zone, for the flood zone. You're gonna put 500, you're gonna put all these coltex in there and it doesn't work because, because the aquifer depends. It, we have to, we have to uh, hope that it doesn't, we have dry, uh, a dry spell before the heavy rains, you know? I mean, and these storms are getting worse and worse. And this bar has to be, and this these laws have to be good for 50 years from now. And I hear this a lot from all of the engineers who come here and they go to the planning boards. I go to the planning boards, the zoning boards, and, and they say, well, it's better than what's here now because we don't have any storm water in this building now and we're going to put a few cold tanks in there. 
Okay? To me, that's not good enough. It's not good enough. It's it's not it's not a good enough insurance policy for the people who live in the flood zone. I want the best that we can have. Is it going to cure flooding? No. But 35% of the flooding comes from ourselves here. Am I correct, Dan? 35% of the watershed is below the Mavaranek Dam. Yes. 35% of it comes from us. If we don't clean up our backyards, we can't go to Harrison or Scarsdale and, and, and complain about them if we don't, if, if we're just, you know, excuse my French, but pissing on our legs. So it's a good step forward, but it has to be tweaked. This mandatory roof detention system <laughs> has to be in there. It's the only way. It's the only way for the future of Americanic. And it's not, it's not about what's better there, there now. I get that. There's nothing there now. But it's for the future. 50 years from now, 60 years from now. If they say, yeah, they did the right thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard. When Pippi, yada, 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 you know the rest. Uh, first of all, Augie, I just want to say hello. I'm always happy to see you. And remember, when you talk about the friendly village, the F and friendly village stands for Fusco. I hope you're doing well, my friend. <laughs> um, I concur with uh, a lot of what's been said. I'm very happy that um, you give me uh, a lot of credit for uh, raising the houses for doing your short check redemption when he got the money for the library, then he went for twice as much. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, with the water retention I believe Waverly Avenue and a lot of these projects with the uh, planning department are having 100% water retention uh, beyond that um, anybody who's getting the water retention systems especially if they need uh, maintenance we have to have a complete list but we have to make sure that the maintenance is done I know that's something that the engineer has told me that he's uh, actively working on because it doesn't make any sense to have the water retention systems throughout the village if they um, if 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 they're um, if they're not maintained and they start to fail. So I think it's very important to have that list developed. Um, also, I think that um, we we need to uh, try to embrace our neighbors and try to see if we can actually uh, come up with a. Uh, a water management district, which includes Port Chester, Town of Rye, City of Rye, Nourishell, Town of Amernick, uh, Village of Larchmont, um, Harrison, White Plains, and Scarsdale. Because that's basically where, where our water comes. And each, the, each of these uh, locations also has problems with local flooding. And if you have a group of 300,000 asking for grants and help from the government, it's 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 a lot, a lot louder voice than twenty thousand. So I think that you know, reach out to each community. If you need people from our community to go to other meetings, let us know that you know we're going to speak and see if we, as the village of Marnie, can give full support. We can start with like the town of Marnie and go from there and see if we can get everybody on board to be standing together, three hundred thousand strong, about dealing with grants and dealing with the entire watershed from the top to the bottom. Uh, there's been a lot of good ideas. Um, uh, we are working on the dam. We have talked about having pumps. We are talking about um, a, a highway uh, mitigating the floods. So understand, no one solution is gonna solve our problem. But if you have 20 different solutions and each one is worth 1%, 2%, 3%, 4%, we can get 80% of what, what we're looking for and then come up with more solutions for the last 20%. But it, 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 it's, it's, don't reject one plan because there's another. Accept one plan and then add to it with, with more and more ideas. And don't be afraid. Just keep coming up. Keep banging your head. It took me three years, but they finally are raising the houses. And eventually they do listen. 
and uh, we, we've come a long way with the uh, with the flood, and hopefully with the Army Corps of Engineers uh, pumps dealing with the dam, uh, river dredging, and other ideas, we can slowly but surely get everybody out of uh, the floodplain and make everybody safe at night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else like to come? Okay. Uh, so, you know, the comments, you know, I, I, I'm very much in favor of the law. Uh, I think that it is a, a real common sense uh, solution, not a solution that's going to fix everything, but, you know, it, it's, it's a, a step forward, as uh, Bernie said, it might not be his idea of what's perfect, but I just want to point out that the, uh, the uh, idea of the 500 year flood, you, you, if, if you don't take the 500 year flood on the C1 and C2, if you don't take that option, you have to do everything else to get to, because if you will look, if you, it, it was hard to see, but it, you had to get to a score of 100. And 500 year flood was 75 on the scoring and everything else added up to 105. So it, it would behoove people, and the idea was to be, it would behoove people to go with the 500 because it would just be a lot easier and quicker than to have to jump through all those hurdles. Correct. And there's also two other items on that list that don't count towards your, well, one of them counts towards your stormwater compliance. The other is the porous pavement and permeable pavement does not count towards your stormwater compliance. And therefore, you have to do the 100 year baseline, the other, you know. Uh, aspect of this law are adopted plus the permeable uh, pavement stuff. So in either circumstance, you'd be exceeding the requirements. And I just want to clarify one other thing. If I'm a if I'm an individual home homeowner, say in the uh, in the in the R five district, right, and I want to put an addition on my house, this only kicks in if the cost of the addition is equal to twenty five percent of the cost of the house. Is that correct? So if I'm putting a patio outside, if I'm disturbing area, but it only it only triggers by a, a, a numerical dollar amount. For a major renovation. Yes. For correct. a major renovation. And, and just to clarify about the green infrastructure, that was something the planning board asked for mm -hmm. um, back in 2019 mm -hmm. when PLLC uh, mm -hmm. was adopted and it had a green infrastructure requirement but without standard. Right. So I, I thought it was important to get at that at the same time as addressing additional uh, stormwater requirements. Okay, thank you. That's good to know the history yeah. of that. And and ex explain for me um, uh, bicycle parking, solar panels. That was mentioned. How that figures into this? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it's it's a reasonable observation. I mean, uh, I like it. But, he did, but, oh, he, I think you just said it was, yeah, it was a that, recommendation of the plan. So oh, the green okay. infrastructure, and green building elements were defined. Oh, Although that's the green, green building, building. Okay. and they were required, but it just said to the satisfaction. Planning board and the planning board thought uh, at the time they requested that additional standards be um, included in the law. Okay, so there's, there's many, many, so there's many cooks involved in this. And, and, and I thought it was an appropriate place to put the 500 year uh, uh, one of the options to, to reach the 100 year. But, but clearly, anybody, any reasonable person looking at this will, is going to say uh, the 500 year is the way to go. I would hope so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, what happens if, like, if we ended up putting a mandatory um, uh, uh, roof detention? You think that would deter people from building, or what do you, what do you, what was the hesitation of not putting that in? Um, so it's possible it would deter people. Um, it also would kind of cement one building design style, mm -hmm. um, and you know from. This, this is something that the trustees can obviously debate about if you want to. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it would um, create kind of a land boxy kind of template for like, most buildings if, yeah. if the whole roof was tension. Um, but otherwise, you know, I think blue roofs are a great option in the industrial and mm -hmm. Washington neighborhoods where we, there is a concern for depth to the groundwater. Um, where they could fill up during uh, when the water table goes up. Um, so, you know, I think it, it, it will depend on the site and then, you know, 
with yeah, Coltex has done work. Kids, I think it's probably better if an engineer keeps talking about this uh, mm -hmm. other than me, but. No, that's fine. Um, is yeah. there is there any, at any way, any place for there to be wiggle room for somebody not to have any type of rainwater, uh, uh, them, uh, roof detention or any type of those systems? Is there a wiggle room? Uh, not on, in the infill provision, no. You'd have to have some type of storm water system. Right. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, all right. Do you have an additional comment? Thanks, I just had a question about the 25% um, criteria. So if you have a $2 million pound, and you're doing four hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of work. That exempts you from what? It's it's based upon the cost of the house, right? Not, not so the property. Not the prop. House. Not the property. You have a two million dollar house. Okay. You are going to do four hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of work. Okay. What does the what are you exempted from? From having to treat the entire lot as from having to treat the entire lot as though it's undeveloped. So basically, what it says: if you get over the twenty-five percent, your existing roof, all the leaders on that roof, your driveway, they have to go into a storm system. Okay, but not plus the addition. You know, whatever addition you're doing. In other words, right. so you'll still have to do stormwater management for the entire house. If it if you're doing an addition right. that costs more than twenty five percent of the value of the home, then you have to direct all stormwater from the existing structure to a stormwater system. Currently, you only have to treat the addition itself. You don't have to have the roof leader in your driveway going to a storm system. Those are going to remain as is. Right, that's if your improvements are more than 25%, right? Yes. So my question is, if they're less than 25%, say you're not doing anything to the house, but you're, you know, putting in decks and patios and all that kind of stuff, then you would only have to treat what caused the disturbance, you know, reach the 25%. So just the okay. it. So you wouldn't have to. Do you wouldn't have to control the stormwater coming off the house? The that whole means, house, though. The whole house, right? Yeah, only the portions that you're adding on to, okay. which is what is the current requirements. Okay. Is right. the calculation based on the value of the house or the value of the house and land? We define that. The value of improvements, so it's anything other than the land. Okay, so 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 just okay. The house. Fine. At at the time of the application, okay. so existing, not existing. So just to uh, comment on Greg's comment about the, the way these places look, the square boxy look. <laughs> uh, the idea is just for commercial or multifamily. So all of the ten places that I mentioned, so, Alcohama, uh, Granite Street. Everyone except for the Avalon has a square box look to it. Mm -hmm. Everyone, mm -hmm. if you drive around the village mm -hmm. on the Maranick Avenue, ninety percent of the ninety-five percent of the buildings are all square boxes. In the industrial area, they're all square boxes. I'm not asking to put a roof detention system on a, a residential house where Unless it's more than, you know, if it's a four family house, then it's a got to be a box with a pool on the top. Think of it that way. Yeah. They can go swimming during the summer. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, anybody else want to comment on the board? Uh, you know, I'm glad we're doing this. We've been talking about it for a long time. Um, I think we have to make sure we have a new, you know, we have a new building inspector. We just got a compliment today for for a project well done by an applicant. Um, I think that we need to make sure that we are, it's, it's a stronger law. And, you know, Greg's at those planning board meetings, we need to make sure that the law is followed. And I think that's that's our, that's our the next hurdle. We got the law passed and now, you know, it's, it's up to- okay. Well, we haven't got the, the law passed well, just yet. We're close to having <laughs> the law passed. And I think it's it's just now up to- If you were a betting person or anybody- I, I, I just want to make sure that 
you know, we are able to stick to our guns and thank you. Keep it. Yeah, it's 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 of course it's not enough by itself, but uh, I always say it's when it comes to flooding, we need to do everything yesterday, so we do this today. Uh, do another shot. Go ahead. Thank you. So it's up there hearing that 35% of the watershed is below the Maranek lines. Here's the map of it. And this tiny portion down here is Maranek. So 35% is more than a third. I'm not sure that's one third of the entire map. Right. Mind you that we're talking about roofs here, retention roofs and additions to homes. Retaining this water, right? Talking about thousands of square feet compared to hundreds of square miles, okay? So I'm all for making the right moves and making smart decisions. But if you want to make an impactful adjustment to the problem, you have to start thinking a little bit bigger. Not, you know, retention systems for somebody's house, they wanna put on an addition, they they have maybe they bought a you know an inexpensive house that was you know a fixer upper. They want to put on a small addition and fix it. Now they have to put in a retention system. Mm -hmm. The cost of having retention systems on roofs. I understand we want to do all the things that we can, but it will start becoming cost prohibitive for any developer to want to improve their lives. People will just decide so not to. Properties will become derelict. And then you'll be de dealing with a much bigger problem on your hand. You'll be dealing with people that are just leaving instead of improving the site that they are on. So this, if you mandate this, this will become a larger problem than it is a solution. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, anybody else on the board want to comment? Nobody else on the board wants to comment? Okay. And a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. Okay. All in favor of closing the public hearing. Aye. Aye. Uh, I need a motion to, uh, th there's a resolution in front of us uh, that uh, has the all the requisite uh, I's and T's uh, dotted and crossed. It has a consistency review and uh, it has, uh, talks about that we, we received information from the planning board. So, with that being said, do I need a motion to adopt the law? So moved to, to adopt the PLLW 2023. Can I have a second? Okay. okay. Uh, call the roll, please. Trustee, Trustee Rawlings? Yes. Trustee Azer Reed? Yes. Trustee Young? Yes. Trustee Lucas? Yes. Mayor Murphy? Aye. Thank you all very much. Okay. All right. That's the first law. The next law on the agenda is the Streamline Solar Panel uh, Permit. Uh, what this law does is if you were putting solar panels on your house right now, if you're putting solar panels on your house, you have to go before the Board of Architectural Review. Uh, everyone who's putting up even one solar panel has to go to the Board of Architectural Review. What this will do is this will allow you to put up to 20 panels on your home and just get it passed in the building department. If you go over 20 panels, then you have to go uh, to the BAR uh, for, uh, is it usually one or two hearings? You go to the BAR on these. It depends. Um, so it, it depends. It depends. Usually it's one or two hearings. Okay. One or two hearings. So <laughs> with, with that preamble, I need a motion to open the public hearing. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, Greg, you want to talk about this a little? Would Bob, whoever wants to? I think you summarized it quite nicely. Um, oh, it's, really? It's, uh, it's a law that if, if you're under 20 panels, uh, you would not require BAR um, approval. Uh, it also indicates that the panels have to be oriented the same way, um, whether it's horizontal or up and down. That's um, based on commentary that uh, we heard from the BAR. So we're going to talk to we have the AR look you know, uh, come up with some criteria for items that they felt um, could be handled by the building department and the, the criteria they set. And uh, that's what informs the, the law. 
I, I have a question uh, with Lord's turn. Uh, give him the mic. If we were to decide, because uh, I know there's going to be comment to this effect, uh, to uh, not require this to go under any level to the planning, uh, to the uh, BAR, would that be a substantive change? I'm saying remove the 20 at all restriction? No. You say that, 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 that the BAR has no, no say about the solar panels, period. So you'd be effectively removing the, the removing the BAR. Removing the planning panel right now. Yeah. This law would not require you to go with BAR if you're doing 20 panels or two. I don't understand that. But I'm, I'm saying, you, I'm you saying if I would you never have to go to BAR no matter how many panels you're installed. Yeah. That's my question. That would be a substantive change. Okay. 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 Uh anybody want to make comments on this law? So Please. To what you're getting at, what the 20 panels? Can we can can we revisit why the 20 was chosen? Are you asking that of me? Whoever wants to answer, Mr. Cutler. I, 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 Greg looks like he's ready. That, that was just the input from from the BAR. From the BAR, BAR okay. I, uh, I brought the question to them mm -hmm. because the Food and Green Environment was interested in advancing the unified solar permit, uh, and they met and discussed it, and they felt that based on their experience that. You know, under 20 panels, as long as they're oriented mm -hmm. in the same direction on the rewind, um, seem to be okay. And it, okay. I guess the review got more complicated than they got about that. Okay. Uh, I can't really speak for them, but that's the input that I heard from them. I, I know that members of the uh, of the committee for the environment have uh, thoughts about this. So why don't we open this up to public comment? Here's the answers. No. <laughs> No, don't set me up. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm David Freeman. I'm chair of the uh, village committee for the environment. We talked about this in the meetings. We are very much in favor of this law. Uh, it's uh, it's very important to encourage people to solar panels in their houses. It's consistent with state policy and the planning. And it's it's definitely and it also actually uh, enactment of a you know like a solar panel law would give the village credit for being a community which actually puts money in the box which then comes with community once we get certain you know what you get this year you can part with help from the passage of this law. Um, and Leah is going to talk about some specifics, including the, the, the 20 panels, which, by the way, the Committee for the Environment doesn't think this is, is, is necessary to have that uh, description. Uh, but I do want to ask a question, and that is, is this law is really not a unit, it's really not a solar permit law. It's, it's an exemption for permitting for certain particular um, projects for the BAR. But there is a unified solar permit that has been established by the state. It's on the uh, sort of website. And there's actually a resolution, a standard resolution that one can pass that actually, in effect, says the village of the town of Blank establishes this permit as the permit to use for solar and this permit that's attached to it. I'm wondering if that's part of this proposal, or that would have to be a separate proposal. I, I think this proposal and, and this law, the genesis of it was because all law now requires uh, the, the BAR to, to hear it. Mm -hmm. So I think that that was what we were trying to clear up here. So I think in addition, the, the committee would strongly urge that the board consider, maybe not tonight, but in short order, actually adopting the unified solar permit, which is a Permit and it's a resolution that says we're adopting is, is the way we're going to do solar permits. That, that, that might be something that could be done administratively. I don't know. Well, if it can be, so, so much better. I think it's, it's this is an issue of uh, we have to crawl before we can walk. Okay. If we have to get to, in order to get to, you know, point A or point B, right. we have to point A first. This isn't good. Yep. Say, it's just a nice step. Yeah. If 
we can't do it administratively, we should do it legislatively. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Liam. Liam Robert Hayden from the Committee for the Environment. Um, to the point of the unified solar permit, I think there's 11 other municipalities in Westchester that have adopted it. The point of it is to make getting solar panels on your house easier. So, mm -hmm. you know, it just unifies the whole process so that every municipality is hopefully the same. And if you're a contractor, a homeowner, it should reduce the costs of getting solar panels. Um, it does allow for Board of Architectural Review and the, um, an exemption for historic buildings, which is something that you were heard about a lot. Um, my concern with the, the 20 panel number is that that might cover an average house. Right? It all depends on the panels and the and the um, sunshine hours and all, all sorts of things like that. So um, you know, I was my summing up my street just put on solar. They're not in a large house, and I counted they have forty eight panels. Oh, really? Nice. So I'm just wondering if this is slightly arbitrary, this number, and um, if, you know, we can come to some agreement with the Board of Architectural Review where they set some guidelines that can then be enforced by the building department, okay? So the object is to make this process easier, not hard. Mm -hmm. So that would be... Uh, would be my request. Thank you. You're welcome. But do you think we should go ahead with this tonight? Because it's like a it's one step in making it easier, or should we go back to the or well I understood that this didn't incorporate the um, unified solar permit, which we've been asking for a while. Um yeah, by all means go ahead tonight and make this easier, but you know. I don't want to be standing here in a year saying, what about the next year? <laughs> so that would be my help. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, I think the unified solar permit is a great idea. The one thing I mentioned about the 20 panels is um, solar panels come in different sizes. Um, there's some solar panels that are 17 square feet. So I'm not sure what the 20, when that was come up with, I'm not sure what size panel they were envisioning, but you might want to consider just changing it to a certain amount of square feet of solar panels. Thank you. Any other comments from the audience? You know, instead of passing this tonight, and then amending it in a year, as Liam pointed out, it, this shouldn't seem like a hard thing to redo and then pass it the end of November or something like that. Just like any of our laws. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't think it, it's... Because uh, it, it, I, I understand a point about 20 seeming arbitrary. It, it, it does. I, I don't understand it myself. I don't. Well, what if, well, it was a rhetorical question to everybody but you. <laughs> just 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 say that this no longer has to go to the AR. Yeah, a, a simple and, and, and then um and and now to get solar panels you use a unified form and, and we're done. Unless unless the BAR wants to weigh in between now and then. Laura, what do you think? Well, I'm looking at the Unified Solar Permit, which is about five pages and has a lot of information on it. And I think we really should check with the building inspector for yeah. to see whether, you know, see. Right. I mean, I think we have to figure it. I think all the stakeholders 
need to understand what we're switching it to. But um, but my, my the question really is: Do do we want to have uh, a law just taking BAR out of the process at this point? Because what we're doing tonight was uh, you know limiting BAR's input to twenty panels or below. So do, and I'm in favor of just taking BAR out of it and uh, allowing the building inspector to set certain guidelines, as, as you pointed out, with uh, maybe the, the advice of BAR. Does that sound good there, Bales? Sounds good to me. Just one thing on the permit. I mean, there's kind of a, a limited universe of contractors out there who do solar installations. So it's not like it would be something alien to them, just right. the same permit used in the village of Mamaroneck as used in no, I think the municipalities. But I'm just pointing so, out that the law that we're talking about right now is not about permitting. Yeah. It's about excising VAR. Oh, does that sound like a good idea? I, I think we should explore it. I think the building inspector needs to look at this permit. Um, no, but we're not talking about the permit. This well, but, about what we're, the permit. but what we're adopting. No, just just back up one second. What what this law is and only is is about removing and limiting BAR's participation. That's what we're doing here tonight. There's nothing in the law that we're passing that has to do with a permit. So that, that's a separate issue. So the the issue uh, is, you know, not not are we going to have adopt the solar permit right now, but is whether or not. BAR is part of the approval process, the solar panels. Well, okay, but that whole conversation started because the Committee for the Environment wants us to adopt the New York State Unified Solar Permit. So we're just, I, just, just please let me finish. Okay, I'm just sorry. eliminating the BAR doesn't do that. One of the criteria in, in, in this application is, and this is what Liam noted that I had brought up, the, the application is not subject to review by an architectural or historical review board. So, um, so yes, if we're going to take the VAR out of it, then we would also have to take landmarks out of it because land, anything that is a landmark has to go to the VAR. So like that's that's just our little specific code. But we're still not. But just removing the VAR from this doesn't get to what they've asked, I, and that's I think that's. No, I, I I I understand it, but I understand what you're saying, Nora. But the the, the, the law isn't about we're not we don't have to pass a law possibly to adopt the unified solar permit that could be done administratively what we but none of that can be done until we get BAR out of process because even if we adopt that uh, unified uh, permit it, it doesn't it, it would then be in conflict with the law about the VAR removing the possible conflict yes so I, I, I agree that we should adopt that but it, it doesn't well, have to be done at the same time I also think based on Liam's email and lo looking at the unified solar permit, solar permit again, that this, that you can adopt the unified state solar permit, but exclude certain projects. So if it's number, for instance, if it's, you know, it's, it's 25 KW or less, it's, it's not subject to review by an, a, a BAR or, or an historic review board. Then you simply you still have adopted this unified permit. You just exclude certain properties from it. So I think I think we kind of went. We got asked to do something. We thought we were doing something, and we didn't go about it the correct way. Okay, just let, let me let me get this one more time. Even if we adopted that permit, we would still have to change the law. Yes, and we would have yeah. to decide what. Uh, but we would we don't have to eliminate the VAR from it. We have to decide under what circumstances, if any, okay. the VAR should okay. be involved. The, the, the question then now is: Do we want to eliminate the VAR? And 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 I think that there is a consensus to eliminate the VAR. Oh, the the, the sorry to throw another another equation, but the landmark there are eleven mm -hmm. landmark properties um, that are laid out in the sort of preservation part of the code. So you, I don't know if you want to include this. The VAR does the um, certification of appropriateness. Um, so they would see that. They would so have yeah, to see that. that out for the story yeah. that's okay. your discretion for the landmark property. Uh, okay. The last thing. Yeah, please put the mic. So 
So you can adopt the unified solar permit. Yeah. And the village can get credit for that. Yeah. With climate scout communities and clean energy communities. Right. If a homeowner wants to install solar panels and one of the requirements is Board of Architectural Review oversight, that can still happen. We but understand. It defeats the purpose of having mm -hmm. the unified solar permit. We understand. It's yeah. not streamlining mm -hmm. the process. Right. That, that's why I want to take VAR. And in the, the same with. Mm -hmm. I think the zoning, if, if something is zoned as an historic place, mm -hmm. then that has a that designation supersedes the the unified solar panel. Right. But you can still have those things. It's just becomes less you know useful. Agreed. All right. What does the boards want? So we uh, bring it back uh, two weeks. We take the BIR out of the picture and uh, and, and adopt the. Um... Better go in a work session in two weeks. Yeah, yeah. Three weeks. Three weeks. November yeah. thirteenth. And then and then make any carve outs. We want to eliminate the the eleven historical buildings or exempt them or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Is everybody all right with them? Yeah. Yep. All right. Then I need a motion to close this public hearing. So moved. Moved. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Thank you. We blow a law. Wait for some laws. All right. So what this would is ban uh, gas blowed leaf gas powered leaf blowers in the village of Merrick. Uh, is that correct? Yes. And and you want to give a little. We adopt this law to ban the use of gas power leaf blowers after May 15th of 2024. Okay. So it would, it would, it would keep the time limit uh, on leaf blowers still in place. Okay. Uh, only thing, mm -hmm. just no more gas. No more and, and, and the practical result is that, that only, only electric blowers would be permitted. Unless there's some other technology. Yeah. Yeah. Nuclear. <laughs> Nuclear. <laughs> Uh, okay, the, the, Jerry, the, the the village itself is moving toward electric power leaf blows, are they not? That's correct. Okay. I just want to point that out. So we, we're moving in that direction. So, yeah, so the village is not exempt from this law. No, the village is exempt mm -hmm. from this law, but we, 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 are, we are moving toward that okay. in practicality. We just don't want to buy it all new. Okay. Uh, all right, I need a motion to open this public hearing. So moved. Second. All in favor. Aye. 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 I have a question about that. Sure, so, please. What about the schools? Same same thing. Uh, the schools are not, first of all, we don't have jurisdiction over the schools. Anything that happens on school property is not uh, is not controlled by Village of Maronic zoning law or code. It's as strange so as that. It's by the superintendent. Uh, it's, it's actually, I, I think, under New York State law, it's the Department of Education. So are they going to get a, a memo of some sort? Because I live right by those schools, by America Avenue School, and I can tell you that they start least blowing like 7 a.m. And, uh, you know, I can call the cops and they say, oh, there's nothing we can do about it. And they don't. So... Knowing that that's going to happen, you know, they're going to be using either electric or battery, right? Future. I want to. Know, I want them to know come that come that day, that day, that they're not going to be able to. They're going to have to change their tunes. So I want to know who's going to who's going to get these memos or. Well, we 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 could strongly suggest it to them, but we can't force them. That's fine. Okay. That's fine. Thank you. Hey, Jerry. Sorry. Jerry Winchester, 1025 Cold Road. Um, I use leaf blowers. I don't know if you've ever used an electric leaf blower, 
but you can't really blow leaf, especially in the wind or any kind of wind. Um, first of all, they have to be charged. The average uh, handheld leaf blower, you probably get a half an hour if you're lucky, if you have an 80 uh, volt battery. Otherwise, what you do is you wear a backpack, which is probably yep. four of them. Okay, and you'll probably get an hour and a half because they work in unison. Now, I understand we're trying to have emissions, lower emissions and all that kind of stuff, but you still have to charge these things. And we have to understand that you have, you have gardeners around here. You have people who do driveways. You try to seal a driveway that's got dirt on it. I see some contractors actually have like an air tank and they're going around with the air tank and they're going on that. Now, before when we put this leaf blower uh, in, in effect, we talked about how we were putting out dust in the environment, uh, pollen in the environment. Uh, Particulate matter. If, if, but the electric blower does the same. Yeah, no, yeah it does, you're right. And, and so, like, I remember we adopted a plastic bag law. We talked about how Tom Romero did it, mm -hmm. I did it. Then we did the leaf blower law. Well, we talked about the Romantic did it, I did it. We don't always have to do what everybody else does. I mean, it makes very little sense for a contractor who had so much more time to our gardeners. You know, how does he do his job? That's what I'm trying to say. I'm, do, I'm, I'm a gardener on and fetch it inside. But don't just pass laws because everybody else does it. And if a leaf blower, it blows. It doesn't matter how it blows. You understand what I'm saying? If we hooked it up to a water gen, a generator, it's still going to blow and put particulates out in the air. So at some point, we can't put a bubble around my man. We can't put a bubble around people. It's just something we're going to have to deal with. And I mean, that's just my take on it right. because I do it for a living. And I know that can't do it. My man will be a little bit dirtier. But the village does this, it exempts itself from the same laws that it puts on the people. They can't do that. We're, we're pushing to uh, to go all electric as well. You're, and you're going to find out that that doesn't work. That's what I'm saying. And then you'll come back. Hopefully you'll come back and retrofit the law. Mm -hmm. But again, you shouldn't exempt the village from something that you're asking us about. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, uh, strongly supports this law. And uh, we actually did a deep dive. Uh, we didn't just pass it because it's good, good for the environment. We actually took uh, some testimony from people that have had experience, including scientists. And the interesting thing is, at least I was coming to the leaf blower law initially because of the noise issue, but it's actually the noise is the least least important from an environmental standpoint of the impacts of leaf blowers. They store up particulates, which we, and and for for hours after you use a leaf blower, mm -hmm. there are particulates in the air. It's bad for people with asthma. It's bad for kids. It's bad for animals. It's bad. It's actually worse for people that actually use the leaf blowers. Uh, it's, a, it's a health issue. It's an environmental health issue. It destroys the lawn ecosystem. The lawn is grass, but it's also microbes and and pollen and worms and insects. You have an entire ecosystem. When you take a leaf blower, you actually nuke the ecosystem and make it unlivable for anything but the grass. And it's not very good from an environmental conscientious standpoint. And finally, it increases the carbon footprint. And uh, and as I said. The, the big impact is actually on the workers that are reading this stuff on, on a day to day basis. So, but we would go further. A couple of the comments uh, resonated with us. First of all, we don't think that the village should accept itself. I think the village should lead by example. And I think it's, and this is just something that uh, if you, you follow, I'm, I'm sure the correspondence between uh, Mr. Barrario and, and Judge Darago and she was talking about the, the difficulty of asking people to abide by a law that you yourself are not abiding by. I think we, as a village, should lead by example. We should not have to use these blowers. I don't want to put the 
those those two different areas. Now that I understand, uh, as as Tom uh, as uh, Mr. Murphy and Mr. Young said, we're moving toward uh, not using uh, we're not using gas at all, but we're moving toward not using leaf blowers because there are technologies now that allow people to mulch the leaves. Any major piece of leaf blowing equipment, you can you can actually put a mulcher uh, in back of it and mulch the leaves into the lawn, which creates fertilizer. Uh, you can put the leaves around the bulb, the, the bushes which protect them in the winter. So uh, that's the newest technology. And we think we should, long term, we think we can probably do without leaf blowing, but in the meantime, this is a very good first step. The one other thing that we would recommend is trying to make it consistent with the ability of large money. One of the problems in enforcement and equitability is that each municipality has a slightly different law. And with a little tweak, we can make actually two tweaks. We can make that this law consistent with the village of large money, which has had a very successful period is actually the people that were going to come tonight weren't able to make it because they're out of town, but they've had a very successful experience. And the two things that we would do, we recommend that the board consider is number one, uh, making the time frames consistent. So the village of uh, Large Run uh, prohibits leaf blowers in the winter. They have period in the spring you use it. Here in the fall, there's really not that much need for to have to have leaf blowers permitted in the winter. The village doesn't permit it. I don't think we should either. And there's a little tweak in the schedule that if you change the you know, dates from October 1st uh, to May 14th, if you made the permitted period from uh, March 15th to April 30th rather than May 14th. Uh, and October 15th, December 15th, you actually have it completely consistent with the village of America. So we would recommend that. Uh, two other really tiny uh, suggestions. One is um, in, in uh, R1, R2, uh, where we say the operation of meat blowers is permitted. I would we would recommend considering the operation of non gasoline powered leaf blowers just to make it very clear what we're permitting. And then there's a word missing somewhere later in the paragraph that if anybody mystifies the week one that is, I can, I can give it to you. And it out. And Jerry, uh, what, would it, what would be the, uh, the difficulty in not exempting ourselves from this world law? That doesn't feel right. This is a policy move. What? This is a policy. Whatever policy is adopted, we will abide by. Okay. Can you get the mic? I need the mic, Mike. All right. I mean, but from an operational standpoint, why would it be difficult if we if we we, we have very large parking lots and very large areas to clear? But like I said, if the board is interested in not or, or, you know, not exempting the village, so be it. Could we, could we get a, a cost of what it would cost to buy all new leaf flows before we make that decision? We can talking about What? $500 each, we have six of them. Backpack flows? Yep. Or someone will really pay it. Mm -hmm. What that cost me? Okay. So, really up to you guys. Operationally, if the village forces are uh, not exempted, yeah. we'll deal with it. And we have until May anyway, right? We'll deal with it. Yeah. Because the law doesn't take it. As far as the school, they're in their own world. Yeah. Figured? Mm -hmm. um, I actually appreciate how useful leaf blowers can be for certain things, but I believe they're incredibly overused. People like to walk around with them and just blow stuff. Um, 
think it'd be great if you just had a spring clean up <laughs> and that would go on the rest of the time. But my concern, as I brought up with the stormwater management law, is historically this has been a law that hasn't been enforced. And as I've, had, I've always argued, what easier law than to enforce? Mm -hmm. You can hear these things a quarter of a mile away. Mm -hmm. um, and I truly believe that if the village adopted a policy that from whatever the date is in the um, spring, mm -hmm. and just told officers for the first week just to go out and stop everybody and say, listen, I'm starting next week. <laughs> But the way, and I would also agree with Mr. Freeman that the Larchmont law should be looked at. I mean, one of the problems with this law is so I read it. Come next summer, I'm a lawn guy. I send my guys out with a um, gas powered leaf blowers. The um, officer gives them a ticket. They go to court and they say, I was told to do this. I mean, this law says it is an affirmative defense to liability under the subsection that the person operating the leaf blower was doing so at the direction of another person. I mean, this seems harder to enforce than our old law in many ways. Um, so I would look to Larchmont which has a section that lists responsible parties. And it lists everybody, like property owner, business owner, by operating. Otherwise, this is just going to be um, the way it is now. I mean, we're all going to hear leaf blowers all summer long. I mean, I hear them in our neighborhood, and our neighborhood's gotten pretty good mm -hmm. over the years. Yeah, still here. Um, so, but honestly, the enforcement part, I just don't get how, you know, if a guy gets a ticket, he goes to the party, he goes, my boss told me to do this. And he walks. So, thank you. Jerry, you can, can you uh, share with the, everybody the, your, your enforcement experience? Uh, so we took a week this summer um, to do um, targeted enforcement and try to educate educate the property owner um, and we wrote up 31 tickets throughout the week uh, we had several people doing and working on blitz doing enforcement and then as david alluded to um they all went to court and a 250 fine would be 50 dollars wholesale across the board um, so there's an issue with the courts and how they look at this law as well. But we typically write about 100 tickets a year. And in that week, we did a third of what we normally do. Just to try to demonstrate that if we get out there more often during a blitz period, that we would, um, we would hopefully get the landscapers to stop using blowers during a prohibited period. but. For fifty dollar, for fifty dollar fee, I think they just can use it as a fund. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Kathy Connell. I'm from the village of Larchmont. I'm Hi. the Larchmont Welcome. Environmental Committee. And uh, David asked me to just come by and tell you that we are very happy. We got a leaf blower fan. We have very quiet winters. And summers. I work from home. I'm a software engineer. My husband works from home. He's an accountant. We had five properties before who would blow all around us, and the sanity of having that level of leaf blowing activity come down has been great. Um, enforcement has been key in the village of Larchmont. We have a really responsive police uh, force who go, go and check on things when they get calls. I think they've been educated very well to realize that it's a quality of life is issue, just as if uh, teenagers are having a party next to you, they would respond to that as well. And they've, they've always, um, they come when you call and 
and try to at least talk to people. They don't always give a, a ticket, but they at least talk to people. And if it's a repeat, if they see them several times, I think they do. I don't know exactly how they enforce it. But if you have questions, we would love to share what we know. Um, we have several experts within our group who really have thought about this and have gone through different iterations. Having the municipality follow the same rule as everybody else, I think would alleviate certain very angry landscapers, which is, we have some problems that we, some of our properties were still being blown with gas powered leaf blowers, even though it was illegal. And the landscapers, I mean, I heard it from them directly. They were so furious and it wasn't, it wasn't fair, right? Mm -hmm. So if everyone's gonna bear the burden, I think it's it's more easily tolerated. Does the town of America have a I'm, I'm village. No, I know that. I'm just asking, do you know if the town of America has a town of America? We have uh, the environmental committee over here. They do not have they have a leaf blower ban only during the summer months. And but the rest of the time you can do whatever you want. Okay, gotcha. All right. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just heard Mr. Barbarian yeah. say they give about they give about a hundred tickets out a year. Leaf blowers. Yeah. I'm sorry. Leaf blowing tickets. Yeah, that's what we've done. Okay. See, I've been following this for 10 years. I don't think we've given a hundred tickets in 10 years. It just it's stunning to me. How Mr. Barbario dissembles to this board in the public. You know, the, I'm sorry. You, you, you're done. No, you're done. it's public hearing. The, the, no, the, that, 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 was, that was an ad hominem attack on an employee that was not necessary. And you I do this all the time. And, be, you know, and before you actually insulted a homeowner uh, at 886. Orient Avenue, and you know you do this constantly, and it's not fair to people who work in this village. It's not fair to people who reside in this village to constantly be the 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 onus of your anger. So that's all I'm going to say. And, and those those tickets would, were adjudicated in this room. Those the tickets were adjudicated in this room. The records are foilable. You like to foil? I, Look I them up. Foiled them for the last ten years. Yeah. And that's why I made the statement I made. Yeah, well, okay. Yeah. I believe it's a disservice to residents to have a village manager. You, you're done. You're done. No, no, you I'm made sorry. an ad hominem attack and you were done, sir. Point. You're lying. And you're done, sir. It's Please. Hearing, you're lying. And, you, and you've been up and you've said your piece about the law. No, 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 now no, you're no, making no, comments no, about no, the no, village and no, manage. Sir, you are done. Hearing. Please leave the podium. Man. <laughs> Please leave the podium. I'm not leaving the podium. Okay. If you want the officer to remove me, no, I don't. Norm will tell you about that. Okay. <laughs> That's another one of your lawsuits, but go ahead. Okay. All I'm saying is that it's an incredible disservice to residents of this village when the village manager feels so comfortable dissembling at public meetings. So uh, let him go, please. Go. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Glenn. I'm hearing two different arguments here. Um, this one funny. argument I hear from the Environmental Committee is that leaf blowers uh, cause dust, they cause, you know, an impact to the environment. Um, they're not safe for the users. But then this law is about electric leaf blowers and gas leaf blowers. So if you use an electric leaf blower, and generally they don't have the power of the other leaf blowers, they're not as efficient, you would be using the leaf blower twice as long to do the same amount of work if it's an electric one. And you're not really saving anything in gas because you have to use X amount of electricity. And how do we create electricity? Through natural gas. We close the D appointment. We don't have any nuclear power. Most, most, of, most, of our, uh, 
most of our electricity now is produced through natural gas or whatever comes from New York State from the uh, from the hydroelectric. Gas. But I understand about time periods. I have no problem with that. I, I understand, you know, limiting the time of day, limiting the day of the week. I understand that. But what I don't understand is what is the difference between a gas leak flower and an electric leak flower? If you know your your greatest um, your your greatest problems with the leaf blower is what it does environmentally. If somebody wants to use a gas leaf blower because it's more efficient, and the question I had for the village was not how much the electric leaf blowers would cost, how many more hours would we have to pay our employees to use the less efficient leaf blowers in order to do the same amount of work? Because if we got to spend twice as much money in overtime in order to use electric leaf blowers as opposed to gas leaf blowers, how is that a benefit to the taxpayers? You know, I understand. I understand restrictive. But I think we've had restrictive, and if you want to make it more restrictive of when you use the leaf blowers, that's fine. But I don't. I just don't see. And I think uh, Jared is absolutely right on this point. I don't see environmentally. What the difference between using an electric leaf blower and a gas leaf blower is only that it makes it you makes you feel better for whatever reason. Thank you. Um, I'd be happy to address some of the things that we talked about regarding not current. Um, oh, there's plenty of that. Start. <laughs> um, so, the difference between gas powered leaf blowers and electric leaf blowers. One, the gas powered put out incredible emissions, the equivalent of a truck, I think, going 3,000 miles. It's, it's, it's something incredible because there's no catalytic converter. It's two stroke in. It's very inefficient. Power wise, the electric um, leaf blowers have greatly improved. I do not think that you will see the manpower excess need that you, you seem to think that you, that you will. Um, I know that for me, I've seen a guy with a gas car leaf blower blow one leaf, um, you know, just, and there's just been a lot of waste with it all. Um, so it was just whether, whether they're efficient enough. Yeah, if they have enough power, efficient enough, or are you gonna take twice as many time using the leaf not, blower right. as the gas leaf I, blower? I agree, they are not as they are getting better, but they are nearly, and they, they do have a lot of power in them. Um, restricting how much access people have to, to leaf blowers is, is really key. I mean, people do want to clean up their properties, but the degree you write is still the same between the two of them. It's just that all the noise and the pollution is greatly reduced. And those are, those are two really big environmental concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Hey guys, three fourteen. So mm -hmm. I was in the industry probably for about thirty five years. A little knowledge about it. Uh, technology has improved drastically. Yeah, that's one and two. It depends on the time of year that you're using. You have a battery or electric or gas. Because during the evening at the fall, when the leaves start tumbling and there's basically get wet, the electric one, battery one is not going to do the same job as the gas. Maybe in 10 years, 20 years, with technology, it's possible. Blower's a blower, cause environmental issues, asthma, blah, blah, blah. It's probably gonna kick it up. It's still a blower. Um, where I get really frustrated and angry is that schools aren't exempt. Someone said here, I was watching all seven o'clock and you know, kids are coming to school, it's picked up, country clubs, village employees as well. Not a homeowner, but I'm sensible. I've done it. I've got a little handheld one, basically for the summer to do my driveway, to do my walkway, and other areas need to be addressed. Other guys are not as sensible. Go strap that uh, back uh, gas power going on, put it on full force, causes issues. I think it's more of a noise ordinance that people are working at home more than the environmental side, quality of the electric uh, issue. That's my spin on so, in an enforcement, we have all these laws on the books, and we've been here many times. 
enforcement, it's tough. It's really tough. Believe it or not. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to back up what the um, our friend from last month said. The gas, I mean, yes, both blowing leaves creates dust. Right? The gas powered creates a lot more particulate matter. So, um, you know, and I think there is a an element of the greatest health impacts on people using it. But also, I think what we're working with with the Committee on Environment is actually trying to get people using leaf, blowing leaves less, right? Mm -hmm. Leaving the leaves. Leaving the leaves on, on flower beds. I mulch all my leaves. I'm the only person on my street who doesn't have a little pile of leaves building up right now. Um, so there are other ways to do it, and I think you know that's a longer-term educational question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so picture a place like Palmer Terrace. Okay. Okay, because that's a dense area with a lot of trees. I watched a crew go there. They have a pretty big crew, and they spend all day at that spot, and. Big places like that, if you're a landscaper, you charge, you're going, to, you're going to put that work in. Okay, you cannot do it a place like that with electric blowers. Anybody in the industry will tell you you can. And you can't do it after a rain. You can't do a place like Bridgefell with all those weeds with an electric blower. The technology is not there. So you're making a law that's going to affect places like this. Now, you want to uh, pick in size? The Harbor Island can't blow. The Harbor Island uses tractor blowers to blow their leaves too and blow their grass clippings. So you're not, if you put that burden on a big piece of property like that or, or our terrace, you will never get it done. You, Carl, you said you've been in the industry for how Can you do that with electric blowers? It's impossible. It's it, impossible. I mean, you're going to come back, people are going to come back, and you, which earlier you said, well, you know, people will just pay the fine out. You know, UPS, they deliver in the city all day. They double park. They add that ticket into the fee. So what we're doing is saying we know people can't do the job. They will violate the law, but they'll do it and we'll get paid for it. That's what you're doing. I mean, just take an extra two weeks, think about it. How can a place like that really, really do the job? How could you do Harbor Island if you did not exempt Harbor Island? You couldn't have guys go by with backpack blowers. You need that tractor with that blower on that front to push leaves. It's just the way this industry does. I understand. I like the environmental aspect. I mulch 90% of the leaves on the properties that I do. That's what we do, but you can't do it when it's a mass place. You can't mulch on concrete. You're not gonna mulch inside people's driveways. You have to mulch on grass. Just keep that in mind. I mean, it's, it's the way it works. Thank you, Joe. Right. You know, this isn't a debate. No, 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 I'm just gonna, I do actually have a gas powered leaf blower, which I use to blow leaves off my driveway. Onto the grass, so I can mulch. Just thought I have to be honest about that. <laughs> Shout you, Zay. Full, full disclosure. <laughs> be driving by tomorrow. Uh, okay. Uh, does anybody in the board have any comments or concerns or questions? Or? I mean, uh, um, having sat, having accompanied uh, Dave and company uh, on the on the deep dive on this subject. The, the real point is that a lot of this debate uh, deals with, with uh, similar to a lot of problems that we approach in where we we uh, treat old uh, old uh, constants like they're still constants when they're really variables, and uh, and the uh, the idea that um, all the leaves have to be blown away or, or off the lawn 
is 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 a constant that we're we're presuming when in fact we know now it's better to mulch them in place where they are. So uh, and the big piles of leaves that get carted off that's sort of a a um, uh, a, a, a practice that is not uh, is not a best practice. Um, this is a a step to what I understand to be a step in the right direction for what the the, uh, the environmental committee were and and, and like-minded people like. Truth is, I don't have a I don't have a serious problem with leaf voice, but I'm listening to people who do, and I think I see where this is going. I see what the future looks like, and I think we should begin moving down this path because that's where it's headed. We can we can um, resist the change and uh, and and uh, and get passed by, or we can uh, we can go with it and uh, and direct it. So that's uh, I think it's a it's a good first step. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, I need a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second, do you want to say something? Yeah, I'm just like I, I do think the idea of of of, of copying um, large mice time frame is a good one, um, and not having it allowed in the summer while and while we're changing it because this law isn't going to take effect for a very long time. I also think just the way we do things in general, we've had two laws that we've discussed that we might have really made changes to at the public hearing. And I think that it might be beneficial to get this kind of input earlier than, than our the public hearing about the law, but when we're actually discussing in the work session, that's all. That's just because I think it, we, we would have benefited from having more public discussion about the um, solar permits if we'd had more public input about it. I know that the Committee for the Environment came to the work sessions a couple of times, but I think that um, we might be it, it might be more beneficial to do it before we're actually having done the notice and schedule the public hearing. But you know, an, an extra, extra two weeks is onerous. Well, it's more than two weeks because we have to re-notice it and rewrite it. I'm just saying, I just think that the more the more input we get in the beginning, the okay. better we, so the better the laws might be. Hearing? Hmm? You're saying that with every public hearing? No, with every public hearing. But I mean, this we have two instances tonight where we learned a lot during the public hearing, and maybe we should figure out how to incorporate public comment into the laws before we schedule the public hearing. That's the hearing. purpose That's of the public hearing. Well, we can also draft better laws. So, okay. Uh, does anybody want to close the public hearing? So moved. Second. All in favor of closing the public hearing? Aye. Aye. Does anybody want to make a motion to adopt the law? So moved. Second. Augustino, call the roll. Trustees Rawling? Yes. Trustee Yezer Reed? Trustee Young? Oh, wait, I didn't even say anything. I'm sorry. I didn't even say anything. I'm so sorry. Um, Trustee Young? Yes. Trustee Lucas? Yes. Mayor Murphy? No. Uh, yeah. 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 I'm sorry. Okay. But it passes. No, I, think, I think we should look to revise it in the future. All right. <laughs> That's, I, I, I agree. And I think we should maybe put it on. I mean, I do think we should revise it. And I think that that's the point I was trying to make. Right, well, so we got a lot of public comment okay. and I think we should change, we should not yeah. allow this to, I think. Should have voted for it. We got, we, got, we got a template to work from. Oh, well, we need to discuss it. Okay. Thank you all for your patience and your endurance. Uh, the next up is the order to bills. Uh, Abstract of ordered vouchers. Tonight's uh, grand prize is $953,567.12. I just had a question and I'm just trying to find it. Um, there was uh, the block part, it's under um, block parties and other events. And this was for the uh, refunds for the scarecrow building. Uh, well, the scarecrow, I guess the scarecrow stuff. There's, there's about one, two, three, four, five payments um, and one was ten dollars above. I don't know if that was a mistake. I don't, there, there were four payments for forty-five and one for fifty-five. 
and I'm trying to figure out why that one. Oh, oh man. She's doing it off the. Uh, it says on oh, mine. It says six out of uh no six out of forty five. Sorry. I want to see it too. Got it. They are on page six. I see yeah, page it. six. Uh, payment. The microphone. Yes. Guys, can we keep can we keep talking or instance? It's hard to hear up here. Thank you. Uh, the microphone. I don't know the law actually entered by recreation, so I'd have to I'd have to look it up. Might be a scrivener's error. Yeah, it's not. That's yeah, just, I thought, I was like, why is that one person get, you know, what did they pay $10 more for than the other ones? Because they seemed like that was the fee. <laughs> no, I can't get on to the account. But, uh, I mean, I can definitely look at the No, we, we, it's, it's my question. It's probably a typo. I'll verify it with this question. Okay. Please verify. Thank you. Any other questions, concerns? I have the general concern that I think we should be looking at the bills. And I want to, I, and <clears throat> after the NICOM training that I, took the controller, I think that we really are not doing our due diligence with the specific bills and that we need to develop a different system for doing that or designate someone else to be the auditor. Have you looked at the, asked to look at the bills? Mm -hmm. Have you asked to look at the I, bills? I have asked to look at the bills, but I need, we're supposed to look at every bill. So I, I look at specific bills, but that's the idea of looking at every bill between a Friday night and a Monday afternoon when we don't have access to them except coming in and bothering a staff person to get to them isn't feasible. And I think we need to develop a system to be more compliant with what I understand to be the training as- Jerry, as uh, not Jerry Jerry's not here. Uh, Bob, can I ask you, uh, under village manager form of government, is, is that a correct uh, thesis that we have to look at every bill like uh, under strong mayor form of government? Then we shouldn't even be approving the audit. I mean, if that's the case, then we haven't delegated it all to him because we approved the audit. Yeah. Then maybe that's, that, that would be a cleaner break. I know in the town we didn't approve the bills. Okay, Mr. Teeter. Yeah, um, I believe that the controller's office would say that the board is supposed to use those bills and know what you're paying for. Um, if the board wants, it can form an audit committee, that's part of the law, um, to do the audit of the bills and look at the bills. Um, but my specific questions are on page seven. There's stain and pest control for Northbrook, Fayette, Plaza, and Waverly. I assume this is for the rats. Um, on page nine, there's stain and pest control for Grand Street and Center Street. Total of these combined is ninety seven hundred and fifty dollars for monthly maintenance. That's nearly one hundred twenty thousand dollars a year. Does this board know what the monthly maintenance is? Is it a matter of putting poison in the curves? What's the page? Thing? Yeah, sorry. Which page? Number seven. Oh, so no. I'm guessing is that what? It's number nine. What's, it's what's nine it says three months of bills. So yeah, when it says it's, yeah, it's just the data pest control. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, what we have here is that it's for three months. Mm -hmm. I, I I'm sorry. Know. My copy says VOM monthly maintenance data pest control on both sheets. 
Oh, I'm sorry. On the second sheet, you're right. On page nine, it says it's for three months. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So is that the past three months or is that, and is that for both? I mean, this is why the board should be looking at bills when you spend residents' money. You should know, you're supposed to know what you're paying for. Does anybody on the board know? And do you know what they do for the monthly maintenance? It's a lot of money, $120,000 a year. I mean, so, I know, I know it takes you, some skills. You, you, to you just learned that friends, one of those bills is for three months. And you're not, you, you just you, learned that one of those bills is for three months. Your, please finish your comments. Okay. The only thing I would say is one, one line says monthly, one line says three months. I don't know which one's right. If you had the bills, you would know. Um, Page 33, future fence, anything replace down fence. The amount is not my question. If it was charged to the line for change, for you for any reason, it's not of some other area. Which one? I'm sorry. What's what? 33, it's the second line. Second line. What is it? Future fence, twelve hundred dollars for a fence repair. My question is, why is it charged to shade trees? Uh, I'd have to check the invoice. Yeah, I mean, if if, if, it, if it was, it, it, it's okay. Just let me finish. It's okay. Well, it's also okay. No, it just stops doing. So the good. next line is live view technologies. I believe these are the river cameras. Another $21,000. Is that a monthly? It doesn't say anything about what that's for. Does anybody know what that's for? Again, you're spending our money. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mr. Tika. No, I was letting them finish their conversation. Go ahead. I know you, you're at a table. Anybody time. know what we're we'll paying $21,000? to live view technologies for? Simple question, $20,000. It simply says it's for the village of Marana cameras flooding, the flood, the cameras. Okay. So, so, so let me get this straight. You expect the people on this board to know every single item on that, even though we have a village manager here. And I you want to come in here and play 20 questions with us. the law requires. Yeah, okay, and, all right. Yeah. The village attorney doesn't. Yeah, and, and the village manager believe. left because you lied about him at that still yeah, and, 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 and he, and he walked out insulted. Public, I think we're um, done with you, Mr. T. Yeah, you, your three I'm minutes sorry. are up. Yes. Did Mr. Barbario say a hundred tickets a year? Your three minutes are up. I will copy the board. Your the three minutes are up. For the tickets for the last three How years. many FOIL requests does Mr. Tigert have right now? Is it 83, 85, 87? What is it? How All is right. It? All right. It's a, please. Please, leave us a mic. Your time is up. Okay, so maybe the board wants to put aside the ones you don't know what you're paying for. Relinquish the board. In a motion to adopt. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 You know? No. You know? No. Well, let me ask why you know. I'm no, because I'm going to follow up with Bob. I've talked to the controller's office. I have some information. I think that either we are supposed to be looking at the bills and auditing them carefully, or we are supposed to designate someone else to be the auditor. But the way we're doing it isn't the proper way. Um, this is not a criticism of staff, and it's an unwieldy process. I know that the staff makes sure that every bill has an invoice. It probably has the contract that that is associated with it if it's a contract. I know it's a lot of work and I know that it's a stack of papers probably like this for each audit. But I think there's something wrong with our process and either we need to be mm -hmm. scrutinizing more 
or not okay, doing this. So, you, so that's why I'm voting no. So you don't want to pay our bills but, tonight. You know what, Tom? No, that, uh, no that's uh, exactly what's going on, Nora. You don't want to pay our bills tonight. Tom, you're you putting words in my mouth. You're, Tom, uh, you're, Tom, you're putting words in my mouth. I want to be sure. First of all, please don't shout out from the audience. You're you're putting words in my mouth. And no. You, you just voted not to pay the bills. You just put, I voted not to pay the bills because I don't think that the process is right. And I'm not going to be, I'm, I, I'm going to, I'm fine. You, I'm, yeah, I'm but, glad you don't think the process is right that you've done a hundred times. You know, sometimes people learn things. I spent a lot of time this fall at dealing with New York state controller training, specifically with this issue. And I want to make sure that I'm doing it right. Yeah. If you don't. So the rest of us will do, we'll pay the bills. You know, Tom, I vote aye. We're gonna figure, we're gonna get some clarity to this in the next three weeks. I believe that Bob and I will figure out the correct process. Thanks. Uh, the next up is the audit of the manual no, manual vouchers. Uh, and most of this is uh, utility bills to the New York State Power Authority. Mm -hmm. Is this the budget for the No, this is this. Stay up there, no. Stay up there because it's up next. Uh, okay. Anybody have any questions or concerns about the, the manual vouchers? No. I have the same ones. In a motion. So moved. Second. Pull the roll, please. Trustees rolling? Yes. Yeah, did you read? Yes. Young? Yes. Lucas? No. Mayor Murphy? Aye. These are the manual vouchers. These are bills that have already been paid before that, mm -hmm. that, that are on uh, that are mm -hmm. on a, an automatic pay. Mm -hmm. Keep the lights on. Things are running too well. Uh, resolution authorizing to execute budget transfer to fund utilities water budget. And this is transferring uh, $11,000 from the contingent to beach utilities water and from contingent $7,000 to public safety utility, public safety building utilities water. Uh, and I think that the uh, the transfer for the beach is most likely for the spray ground. Yeah, because mm -hmm. the it spray is. ground yeah. uh, went over this year. And the rest is for the outdoor sprinkler that is at this building. Yeah, and uh, this is just a follow-up uh, of the comments that I started with. Um, some of the spray part mm -hmm. might have been because they couldn't turn it over, but the other part was that we had raised water rates 10%. So even at the beginning of the year, I knew that my water was going to come in somewhere around forty-five, forty-six thousand dollars based on that. And again, when uh, when you're looking to uh, expand the spray park, one of the things that you're going to have to keep in mind is uh, the spray park. Even though you couldn't turn it off, was also not turned on a lot this year because we had a, a, an awful lot of rain. So there were a lot of days the spray park wasn't actually in use this summer, and we have fifty million dollars worth of uh, bonding to do on uh, county water projects coming up in the next five years. So you're probably looking at further water increases. So you just have to keep in mind that the spray ground cost could go up before you uh, do the new spray ground, 20, 25%, and you could be looking at even $90,000. So I, I'm not sure that at some point if, um, you might want to try to uh, come up with some kind of fee that can be dedicated to the rec department to try to help them out. That way they, they have uh, additional funding to help uh, do what they do. But, you know, we're not going to recoup that, recoup that type of money. Right now we only pay $12 an hour for the part-timers, and Jason has a hard time getting people to the beach, and that's not going to last forever. Eventually he's going to have to start paying people more like $14, $15 an hour, because that's what that's what New York State has. So just keep it keep in mind as you go and do spray parks and parks and things like that, there are other costs, and especially with this spray ground, and unfortunately our cost of water 
has, has risen greatly and is going to raise exponentially after this. So just something to keep in mind to make sure that the funding's in place as you do this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any motion? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, now to the agenda. Uh, resolution authoriz authorizing to execute a professional service agreement, engineering and design services for water quality improvements project at the village owned parking lots at Harbor Island Park and adjacent, adjacent to the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, this is behind the water treatment plant where you're going to be doing paving and this paving uh, is going to be impervious, uh, meaning that uh, the rainwater should not run off it. Pervious. Pervious. It's going to be pervious. The rainwater should not run off it. It should soak into the ground in Harbor Island Park, hopefully uh, reducing our stormwater load into the harbor. Any questions, concerns? Well, the, the only question I had is I thought originally the county was going to take care of this. It was behind me. But, uh, yeah, I guess they... they... Uh, yeah, I guess I, I had uh, reached out to the... Director, uh, the water treatment plant, and uh, uh, Walt didn't remember uh, handshake agreement. I guess that might have happened yeah. sometime in the past. Because they, they stored their equipment there for a long time. Yeah. It's all ripped up. Okay. Well, I mean, you were you were not here. I was not here. No, no, but no I, I don't recall what happened. There, there was an understanding on the part of everybody that that was. Maybe normal message. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. We really can't leave it that way. Yeah. Um. I would question why this project's being done. Um, that parking lot is not used very much. I was down there the other day. The whole western end is new pavement. Um, pervious pavement, if we get a storm surge, will be impervious pavement. That's what pervious pavement does. It has a huge maintenance required, requirement to keep it pervious. Um, I don't see why you wouldn't just pave this parking lot to do drainage improvements, stormwater management and treatment. Um, just seems like a huge expense. The other thing I would say is this resolution appears to approve the contract dated June 5th, 2023, and the contract is not for $45,000, $45,000. That contract actually has a total of $117,000. It's um, for design development phase, stormwater pollution plan, permitting phase, building phase, $117,000. So I would suggest you at least, if you're going to approve this, um, do that. But the other point I've raised is this year, the village is spending $222,000 on our own engineer. One of his duties listed on the webpage is to oversee construction projects like this. I'm not sure why we need to pay $120,000 to an outside engineer for basically a paving job. So with that, I'll leave you. Thank you. Thank you. That uh, that, that parking lot is uh, jammed a lot. It's pretty, pretty busy. It's like a moonscape too. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a little moonscape. I don't know when he shows up. Um, okay. New motion. So moved. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, village wide sidewalk improvements resolution awarding contract for 20, uh, 
3 to 0, 3. Um, engineer, you want to talk about this a little bit? Let me stay up the mic for the next few. Okay, Speaker. Um, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Board. This project is going to install new sidewalks and curbs in the areas around the Dito's Church and the First Baptist Street Church. Uh, it will also include some minor drainage improvements. That is uh, very minor for the places the catch basin color, rebuilding the catch basin. And in addition to uh, plant 15 new trees along under Avenue linked with structural soil to uh, prevent any, uh, any proposed any damage that the tree would cause during you know, their growth in the future. The structural soil is, is utilized to prevent the, uh, the uh, concrete from uh, any upheave from the tree roots. Uh, in addition, this will also incorporate uh, roadway resurfacing in the same areas. Well, we just got a bit opening last week. Um, and apparently, uh, Landy uh, came in as the as the low bidder. Uh, and we'd like to award the contract with a, a potential start date as early as uh, November first. And Landy's worked with us before, hasn't it? Landy had did, has done some TDBG work uh, for us right on East Prospect prior to my employment uh, year. He also did the uh, the dredging in the river that uh, was started and stopped in 2011. I believe that is correct. Yeah. All right. No, it's, yeah. uh, it's uh, eight hundred and sixty nine thousand. Um, yeah, the, the the lowest responsible bid was uh, you you were up by ninety five dollars eight hundred sixty nine thousand and ninety five dollars. <throat> uh, we are uh, requesting a fifteen percent contingency to account for field conditions that uh, we may encounter, uh, which would increase the requested appropriation to one million dollars. Uh, as mentioned during work session, we are dedicating $400,000 of ARPA funds and $176,000 in uh, funds from the Neighborhood Stabilization Fund towards the project. So um, that will pay for a good portion of the project factoring you know, this contract, uh, construction inspection, and uh, uh, the design work we already uh, 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 had done for the work. Yeah. Washingtonville certainly deserves the attention. Yeah, we, we'd received a lot of requests. Obviously, that, that petition with, I think, you know, a couple hundred signatures requesting new sidewalks yeah. in and around St. Vito's. And we want to extend it to our other uh, religious institutions. Okay. Any, any uh, motion? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, the next up is 5C. Stay up there. Uh, There's a resolution authorizing to contract Mount Pleasant, uh, a change to contract uh, Mount Pleasant Avenue sidewalk drainage improvements and authorization to remit payment request number two. Uh, and yes, that's it. Okay. You know what this is? Yes. Yeah. Uh, this is the um, Ralph and Gertrude uh, project and Mount Pleasant and uh, Again, the school sidewalk project. Um, most of these uh, things on the mayor and board are from the stormwater portion of the project where we had encountered uh, non suitable soils for the new culverts uh, to be supported on. Uh, we encountered additional um, uh, concrete uh, structures that had to be removed, additional piping had to be installed. Of it all unforeseen. Um, some of the uh, some of these uh, overages again were additional big plans that we exceeded the uh, the estimated engineer's plans. Okay, great. Any questions, concerns? Yeah. Just a uh, little confusing reading a bunch of it. Um, so um, a portion of the overall project was over due to uh, unforeseen circumstances. So was the overall project the 1.5 million that is referred to? 
in here, and then uh, your your raise in the you know, one portion that was like 189, an extra 90,000. So, uh, could you answer? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Mike. Sorry. I'm going to share. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, you have the, the, the referral to uh, to the one contractor going up to uh, from 189 to like to, uh, number 90,000, but it refers to the overall project as 1.5 million. So you, it's, it is just part of the, the uh, project. Was over budget and the overall project is 1.5 million, and we're adding 90,000 to that. So the overall project bid, the base bid was 1.529, I believe. Yeah. And, uh, there is a change order for approximately 474,000. The 185,000 is related to additional uh, items that were already in the bid that we exceeded quantities, excavated materials, brush stone that had to be put back in place. The other 94,000 were for change orders. Uh, for example, uh, unforeseen subsurface conditions that were not accounted for in the original bid that we had to uh, remove structures, things of that nature. Bid. So, what would be the uh, the uh, bottom line total for the whole project? I believe the bottom line total after this change order would be just around a million eight hundred eight thousand. And we're getting two hundred and seventy-five thousand for a mod community. We're getting two hundred and seventy-five. And then we're going to put in for as much as possible for FEMA. Uh, for the uh, the uh, sanitary sewer that was damaged, correct? Uh, yes, uh, the consultant engineer uh, who was providing the CM services for the project, segregating out the costs specifically for stormwater for reimbursement from the Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Need a motion? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, 5D, resolution. Resolution authorizing payoff of library ten. Uh, the village of Mamaroneck borrowed money to uh, make the library solvent. Uh, the library was uh, going to go out of business in June if they didn't have an infusion of cash because of uh, you know uh, problems with their uh, accounting that uh, we've been assured have been uh, corrected. Uh, We've verified have been corrected. We've verified have been corrected. And uh, if that hadn't happened, there wouldn't be a library right now. Uh, so I'm very happy that the board did this. Uh, but what this is, is the agreement that the, we have with the library uh, to pay us back. Uh, and they're going to be paying us back over three years. And uh, you know, they will be paying us back with interest. So we'll probably make a little money on it at the end of the day. But uh, the good news is that the library will still be here and uh, hopefully they will uh, be here for another 100 years. They just celebrated their 100th anniversary at a very nice uh, gala last week. Anybody have any questions or concerns? Well, it's not quite what we discussed last time because we'll be, they'll be paying back the first hand, but we'll be taking out two hands. Yes. We can't, That's so it's not, as, it's, it's not as, it, we thought they could just pay back firsthand over yeah. a period of three years and that's not the case so we're going to have to issue a couple more tens. we're going to have to keep doing this every so they catch up with us february or march or so so that the library can or that they they they, they raise their uh you know rates enough that uh they could just pay us back so they, they, they have they also have a budget that's coming up so. yeah Right. But I mean, the, the, the thought was that we could have just done the single tan and they could have paid it back over a series of years okay. and that would have been simpler, yeah. but that's not the that's case. Not okay. So they have to pay back the tan fully in this first year. It's due in June and we will have to be doing that probably for the next two years, which is what our what which, which is what the original plan was. When we first started talking about this in June, we thought we were going to have to do that. Okay. So, the amount going to stay the same. We but, but this agreement, uh, what this agreement does is it says that we are, in, in other words, we get paid first. You know, we, we are the, uh, yeah. I think, but we're going to have to vote to authorize a the, the, the yes, board of trustees is going to have to vote to authorize the subsequent yes. two TANs. We can't authorize something going forward. We understand that. Requires the library to commit irrevocably to fund 
each year's payments. They have to do that by the end of this year. Mm -hmm. to make these payments each year. Right. Good. Good idea. No. Do you want to make? So we're paying off the can, right? That doesn't necessarily mean we have to take another food on the can. We could fund it out of uh, out of our own. Uh, Unassigned funds, no. and we're going to be collecting interest on it. No, no, right? Or do we have no, to? No, we have to take another ten. No authority for the village to spend village funds for the library. Okay, there is no authority for the state to borrow money on behalf of the library. That price needs to be paid. Okay, thank you. We have no active information on it. We're going to have the anticipation of the revenue coming in six months. Thank you. Okay. I need a motion. So moved. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Mm -hmm. Good luck to the library. Uh, resolution accepting bench donation. Uh, this is a donation for a bench in Harbor Island Park by uh, Larry Ratner. Bar in Park. what? This is the Bark Park. In, in Harbor Island Bark Park. Yeah. Uh, yeah. By Larry Ratner and Kim Kamen. And uh, this is $2,329.80, and we appreciate their donation. It's very kind of them. Questions or concerns? We need more benches there. It's the beginning. Uh, and, and, and they are, it looks to me like they're dedicating it to uh, past pets. Bugs, Napoleon, and peaches. Beautiful. That's amazing. God bless them. God bless Napoleon. Uh, God bless Napoleon. Uh, I need a motion. So Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Yes. Uh, 5F resolution authorizing the purchase of one Chevy Bolt EUV. Uh, we talked about this uh, at the uh, work session. It's uh, included in our capital budget. Mm -hmm. uh, it's replacing a 2007 uh, Ford Focus. And it's for the building department. Uh, any questions, concerns? Any motion? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, authorization to execute a professional service agreement to provide construction management and inspection services for village wide sidewalk improvements. Uh, the uh, engineer talked about before uh, the many sidewalk improvement projects that we have, and uh, this, this would be uh, providing oversight. Uh, because uh, the engineer can't do it all, and he does a lot. And uh, you know, we have a ton of construction work going on in the village, and some of it uh, will have to be uh, farmed out. But he'll be watching the watchers, uh, like the executive producer. The other guys are the other are the showrunners. I need a motion. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, resolution establishing capital budget account for phase four of uh, dock repair at, at Harbor Island Marina and authorization to purchase materials for dock repair. Uh, our, uh, our harbor master is sitting here tonight uh, patiently and uh, he was at the uh, work session and he explained the uh, needed repairs and Jeff and his crew have been doing the repairs in-house. So what he's asking us to do really is buy the pressure treated wood. The pressure treated wood and all the hardware is supposed to go uh, total of 27 inspections. Mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. Any questions, concerns? What we have, Jeff, here? We should have taken you earlier. In <laughs> <laughs> uh, a motion. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Good night, Jeff. Good night, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Oh, I got to ask him those guys. Pressure treated. I don't know. Give me that. Just, uh, resolution increasing funding authorization for construction of the Bark Park at Harbor Island Park. Uh, Dan, you want to talk about this really quickly? <clears throat> uh, the, uh, as you mentioned, the moonscape uh, of our parking lot located by the she was treatment plant. About one third of it is no longer a moonscape. It looks like a normal parking lot. Uh, that was because we had to 
uh, just make some repairs after we opened up the uh, the bark park. Uh, we used our paving contractor uh, to do the work. The cost was $24,000. There's approximately $13,000 left in the capital budget account. Uh, our general foreign parks has asked that a minimal balance of $3,000 be left uh, in order to take care of any issue that may occur over the next several months. Uh, but he said we could use at least 10,000 of that. We're asking for a $14,500 transfer uh, to the capital account so we can uh, pay the contractor for the work that was performed. And again, this isn't the bark park. This is a park, part of the parking lot. Yeah. I don't really understand why the bark park yeah. is even it was a, we had to get it done. So we need a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Uh, next up is addressing the board again, but I know uh, Yolanda, I believe we would like to say something. Yes. So um, most recently, um, I have been called to, most recently I have been, there's been um, people, there has been concerns of some residents in the community stating that I have posted something online that I did not post. It was a post that was written um, by an uh, organization called One Mermanic that I am affiliated with but I did not write the post, um, nor did I, nor am I in charge of social media or am I the sole person of this organization? And I just wanted to clarify that because when we are a part of something, that doesn't mean that you are the only voice um, and that it doesn't speak to an individual's character. So anything that was posted in the post was, and I will clarify what the post was. And I, and while I can wholeheartedly see how the post offended some people, not all people, but it, it, it doesn't even, if it takes one offending, offending one person, sometimes that is enough, but it offended some and not all. The post start, was talking about um, this young, this young man this young boy, this young youth, this child who was killed in Chicago. And the post stated that it does not condone violence on any person. And it did list the things, especially the things that are going on in this world. Um, it didn't state in its intention, it didn't state that it was for or against any particular person, we just it just didn't denounce any type of violence or terrorism. Um, and while the words that were situated alongside of it, I understand it is how it harmed people. Now that was just me talking regarding the post. Now this is me talking for myself. I apologize if the post harm to anybody. I still believe, as Leilani Isa Reed, that nobody should be harmed. No person on this God green earth should be harmed, shouldn't be targeted. Shouldn't they, every person has a right for self-determination. And right now, because we are talking about people who live in Israel and people who live in Palestine. We are talking, I'm talking about any person has a right to live. And I feel and understand and have compassion and empathy for the, any person who has experienced or even indirectly has had an effect on the things that are happening around this world. And especially in that space, right in this day and time. But what I, I'm gonna leave it at that because I want people to understand my character and who I am, that I am not just a sole person of an organization or aff affiliated with an organization. While I am affiliated with an organization, my words and the organization's words can be two different things. And I can feel, I can feel 
have compassion, I can have empathy. And I also believe as my role in the, as a village elected official, I personally feel that I can have those compa that compassion, I can have those feelings and still love and 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 hold people hold space for others. But I also have to remember as an elected Wait, official please. that I can't speak for one side. Because as an elected official, I have to hold space for every single person. And that is what I truly believe in this work. I understand and hear the hurt that people feel wholeheartedly because I know what that feels like. So I just wanted to clarify all those things and leave it at that. And oh, sorry. And I, I chose to do it right here and right now because it is recorded and it is um, something that some people can go back and, and listen to if they need clarification rather than um, listen to what other people have to say. And I welcome any conversation. I always welcome conversation with any person. So that's it. I'm also part of one of the um, You talk about teachable moments, okay? I, unfortunately, I'm with, fortunately, I was able to grow up in the Marriott, and my aunt was a domestic worker who worked for the equipment family out in the So since a little kid, I've gone to all the different parties and state dinners, the apartments for all the cousins, all the cousins. Um, and so you learn, but not everybody knows. I remember when Rodney King video came out, it took us 20 years to convince people that these things were happening. So when we saw George Floyd video several years ago, it got more people to wake up. And we talked about what is racism to me may not be racist to me for somebody who's white. So what is anti-Semitism anti to somebody who's Jewish may not be anti-Semitism to me. And it may not be because I don't understand. But we're in this environment where we run to social media because we want things for political reasons to hurt people. Instead of saying, hey, listen, 1M, you missed the ball on this. Maybe you should have came to us <laughs> as a community and we could help you understand where you miss the ball on this. But yet we come to point fingers. And how do we gain solidarity by pointing fingers? We don't. Because like they said, you know, pointing fingers because three pointing back at you. So I take her at her word because I know if I mess up, I tell people, put it to my head, not my heart. Put it to my head, not my heart. Because a lot of people joined One Memorandum because its inception was to fight racism. So you then can't think that we're just going to say, okay, anti-Semitism is okay, but racism is not. You know, I posted day one. There was a group, Black Lives Matter Chicago. They actually applauded it. That's not Black Lives Matter Memorandum. Okay? So we can't be held responsible for others' actions. But when we do mess up or we do come to that line that's less than perfect, we admit it. We ask for help, we come together, and we teach each other. But we can't think that things are always to someone's heart, okay? And that's all I'm saying. What happened October 7th was horrible. Mm -hmm. Anyone who doesn't think that was terrorism by an organization whose own sole purpose is to kill Jewish people, if you think that anybody you know is okay with that, then you need to find somebody different. So I'm offering a solution here. If there are people in this Jewish community that are offended by what one Lamatic did, then get together, have a conversation. 
We can have a forum. We can do it at the NY Theater. We can do it in a park. But have a forum. Teach. That's all I'm saying is don't be offended. Teach. Because then we don't make that mistake again. Mm -hmm. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else like to comment? Oh. You know, I, yeah, I would like to say something. Well, I, I meant from the public. Okay. <laughs> I agree with my dear friend here. Um, cancel culture simply cancels the ability to learn and grow as a people. And when you just, you know, you take somebody who, quite frankly, lives lives her life on your sleeve, really does, very very emotional. And you take one line out of content, and you're going to say, "That's how we're going to describe you." That's how we're going to paint you mm -hmm. for your whole life. It's wrong. Mm -hmm. It's wrong on every level. Mm -hmm. And it goes for every one of us. I says, if, if you want to see somebody who has said stupid things over the year, speak to my grandmother, speak to my mother, speak to my sister, speak to my niece. They'll be happy to tell you that I've said stupid things over the years. But you know what? Take it in context of my whole life. I think I've been pretty good. I've been most of the people out there have been pretty good most of their lives. I can agree with you all the time, but the fact of the matter, that's how I feel. Lou, if you don't want to speak, I'm, I'm, oh, thank I'm, you. I'm, 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 I'm going to do address the board afterwards, but let me have you finish with that. No, no, you can't do that. You need to address the board okay. after the ceremonies. <laughs> okay, I just want to uh, mention the passing of uh, Frank Moshe. Yes. He was uh, a sweetheart. Absolutely, the Moisha brothers were uh, members of this community over 30 years. Yes. Uh, fantastic mechanics. The two brothers, the personal uh, friends, uh, Frank's wife Vicky was actually the daughter of my father's best friend, and he will be very, very sorely missed. And I uh, wish everybody in the uh, village just to say a prayer for him. That's great. Um, again, I just want to uh, mention at some point, you're going to have to look at capital spending. You proposed over six million dollars worth of spending in this work session alone. Mm -hmm. You've already passed five million dollars this year, and that doesn't include you have a fire truck coming up, you still have Village Hall coming up, you have the dam coming up, you have Halstead Avenue coming up. So you have a lot of money that you guys are committing. Um, mm -hmm. Finally, um, I want to thank the uh, engineering department because, as you can see, I'm on a walker and I did need to get some permits done. And they were very accommodating. They uh, had somebody meet me over in Village Hall, bring the uh, file over so I could look at it and uh, do what I needed to do at the house. And uh, finally, I want to thank the police department because I did point out that I am um, under ADA right now. And if I wanted to dine and dash, I told the police officer he had to give me a 100 yard head start. And being the friendly village, the police officer looked at me and said, I'll give you 200 yards, Glenn. So that's our friendly village. Thank you. Hey, Glenn, have a good evening. Glad to see you up and around. Anyone else? Okay. Yeah, um, uh, we got we got a lot of e emails. Well, not a lot. We got a, a fair number of emails about the post on William Merrick. And I had a hard time ri writing, returning, answering them because uh, some of them were over the line. Uh, and, and, um, and I had the same trouble when communicating using this phone to my friends in Israel and uh, the territories to find out how they were, because I'd been over there roughly 14 times on multiple assignments and, and, and hundreds, hundreds of assignments and multiple missions. And, uh, and, uh, and I know just how painful and awful that was. It was almost too much, it's almost too much to bear. So I understand how, how hurt people were by this. And I understand how wrong and 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 boneheaded that uh, that uh, that post was not in what it said, in what it omitted. It was a serious sin of omission for context. That said, to see um, uh, my friend and and, and colleague uh, Lalani Yaiser Reed mentioned uh, as an anti-Semite or had she having said anti-Semitic things, uh, and infuriated me on on a, a lot of levels because I know her. And uh, and it's it's just not it's not her and 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 you can talk to her and there's no reason to talk to me about that and call her that name. Um, 
uh, yeah. So, but I understand the hurt these people feel because the 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 uh, the the idea of of uh, of not knowing when you call somebody. Can I even ask if you're okay? If your family's okay? What do you say? Did anybody you know died? How do you even go there? So I understand how how uh, awesome the the hurt is and. For Jewish people, it's pretty serious because you know people have tried to kill them, and 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 it and it, it reminds them of an entire history. So this is a landmine. I use that term when when we talked about it earlier. It's a landmine, and uh, and people need to talk past talk, talk, talk to each other and not use the shorthand uh, of uh, social media to to virtue signal and um, and try to uh, make uh, political points or or whatever. I mean the, the decent thing. Uh, uh, when it comes to politics in this context, the decent thing is to be silent. And, uh, and I guess I'll shut up. Anybody else? Uh, you know, I, had, I, I admitted we have to add a couple of things uh, in, the, uh, in the late hour, I forgot. Uh, I need a motion to add an item to the agenda. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. I'm adding to the agenda is the appointment of Michelle Goodman. Michelle Goodman to the Tree Committee. Uh, all, uh, I, I need to, I'm making the motion. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Now I need another motion to add an item to the agenda. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. And this is rescheduling uh, the regular meeting of. November 20th to November 27th. Uh, it is now, it is, yes, and November 20th is going to be uh, the pre organizational meeting uh, where, the, where the board gets together and discusses appointments for the future. So we're, we're rescheduling the regular meeting that was scheduled for November 20th to November 27th. Uh, and I will make that motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, report from the clerk treasurer. We have nothing to report, Mayor. Thank you, Augie. Mr. Village Attorney. Thank you. Uh, minutes, boards, committees, uh, minutes of the tree committee meeting of September 6, 2023. Minutes of the board of traffic commissioners meeting of September 14, 2023. Uh, as as uh, pointed out, uh, Mosier, Frank Mosier has died. Uh, his his son Frank Jr. Uh, is best friends with my son Tommy Murphy Jr. So I've I've known them uh, for twenty eight years now, and uh, a nicer family you'd never meet. And, uh, I wish him family the best. And if anybody's looking, there was a GoFundMe to help Mr. Mosier and his little brother. He's sick for a long time. Uh, and you know, just these are these are difficult times uh, for a lot of people, and uh, a lot of people are on edge, and rightfully so. The world is uh, not a good place these days, so you know, let's try and treat each other with a little more, a uh, little more compassion and respect, because it's it's a it's a hard world sometimes, and there's a lot of people in a lot of pain. Uh, over the events in 8,000 miles away. And uh, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, just, it's just difficult. And uh, I, I'm very close to people. My, my wife is uh, as family in Israel. And, uh, she spent a lot of her life in Israel. And this is a dramatic, traumatic event for a lot of people. So that... Close with a moment of silence for everybody who is uh, losing their lives in wars across this world. Thank you. I need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Can you put this on the mute? Yeah. Thank you. I was, I was writing something today about this. Except that.